Uh, Mr. Chairman, you can proceed. All right, thank you. Good evening and welcome to the May 13th Bloomington Planning Commission meeting. Planning Commission advises the City Council on development proposals, development standards, <clears throat> long range planning and transportation issues. Some items the Planning Commission has the final decision authority, others the City Council will make the final decision. The Planning Commission is made up of seven volunteers. Tonight, there's six of us, so we have a quorum. And tonight we have five agenda items. Uh, in but before we begin the meeting tonight, we begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Mr. Markergaard, um, if you will, will you uh, uh, let the folks online and uh, on TV know how they can participate tonight? Sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, this is our 27th uh, remote planning commission meeting due to the pandemic and tonight Everybody is remote. All of the commissioners, applicants, and the public are remote. However, we can still take public testimony. We have five public hearings, and if you'd like to testify on any of the public hearings, uh, just give a call to the number on the screen. It's 1-888-742-5095. And then once you're in, in enter the conference code, which is 846. Uh, 1001098. And we'll have this number scrolling across the bottom of the screen uh, throughout the meeting tonight to refer back to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Markegaard. And for those who are not familiar with the public process uh, that the Planning Commission utilizes, uh, just a brief reminder the Planning Commission will get a report from staff. And then the next item would typically be any questions we have of staff and then an applicant would speak to their item if they feel there's more uh, to add. After the applicant has had an uh, opportunity to speak, we'll open the public hearing and at that point, the public will have an opportunity to speak to the planning commission. I'd remind folks that we typically limit the uh, time for each speaker to 3 minutes. So that gives an opportunity. For everybody to speak and then if at the end of the three minutes you feel there's more uh, to add to the conversation we'd ask that you go to the back of the line and uh, and then we'll rotate through that way <clears throat> any questions that uh, the public may have please direct them to myself as the chair and then the planning commission may decide to take those up if they feel they're important enough to the discussion um, at hand in front of us so Tonight, uh, again, we have five items. Our first item, I believe, Mr. Centenario, you have the first item, is that right? Yes, I do, Mr. Chair. All right. Yep, so we can see the application or the uh, presentation, so Great. go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Planning Commissioners. First item on your agenda is for a variance to allow uh, the application of a coating uh, to brick building exteriors, which is essentially code speak for uh, painting an existing brick uh, facade. And the, uh, the address that we're looking at is 7901 uh, Penn Avenue South. So it's, it's a quite a small site uh, outlined in red. Um, you know, this is really uh, just along Penn Avenue uh, where South Town Shopping Center is located. So you have the, the subject site along Penn, uh, you have TCF Bank across the street, uh, at South Southtown obviously is right to the east, and then Interstate 494 uh, is off the screen to the north. What's interesting about uh, this application is uh, for the folks that the commissioners that have been on the commission for a few years now, we actually we received a variance to paint uh, the brick at TCF Bank uh, across the street. A little bit different of a scenario that where that building is predominantly brick, uh, but the variance uh, applications for the same uh, set of standards. So really, uh, we're looking at this variance to allow uh, painting uh, of uh, brick exterior, which is not permitted by city code. This is the building that uh, we're looking at. It's a former wedding day uh, diamonds jewelry store at 7901. And 
as you can see, it's a mix of materials. Uh, you have some glass in, in the front, but then uh, above that uh, brick veneer, that's the lower three feet, uh, it's predominantly stucco. Um, and so uh, this building is about 20 years old. Uh, so essentially what the applicant is looking to do is you know, to re, uh, rebrand and do some uh, external modifications to uh, house a bank uh, in, this, in this building where the jewelry store used to be. So again, we're, what we're really looking at is uh, we're, we're not looking at uh, the stucco as part of this application. Uh, they would uh, reskin the stucco with uh, an acrylic finish, which there's a code allowance to do. But really the issue at hand is painting uh, that bottom three feet of brick on the building. It, it does go around the, the, the building. So uh, we'll, we'll get into more detail in a moment, but. The code is, is very specific on um, what you can and can't do to building exteriors and what the what the requirements are for materials. Uh, and uh, and again, we'll we'll get into the language a little bit, but a lot of it has to do with uh, related to the variant specifically. Is is there something uh, wrong with the brick, or is there something that's deteriorating that requires some sort of coating? So, you know, on my way into the office, I just stopped by the site real quick to take a couple pictures of the brick as it is today. And, you know, it looks pretty good. Um, so this is about 20 years old. And apart from, you know, just uh, basic maintenance, like your caulking seam on between the brick and the sidewalk, uh, the brick itself looked really good. So as far as I could tell, um, and I'm not a Mason, but it, it, you know, it looks like the material is in really good condition. Here's the, as part of the applicants um, move to uh, have a bank at this facility, they prepared some uh, building elevations uh, to identify what, what the changes would be. And so you can see that the, the glass block uh, along Penn Avenue would be replaced by, by more traditional windows. Uh, they would square off the, the vestibule area uh, facing Penn Avenue. It's a more you know, modern traditional or mo modern design uh, and, you know, uh, match the look of uh, the bank. Uh, and then you can see uh, on the lower image, the difference between the existing brick, brick to be painted, and then you have above that uh, existing stucco system to be refinished. And so we're not looking at the refinishing, there's a there's separate uh, specific standards for uh, the application of acrylic finish. Uh, but going to the city code requirements, it, it is very clear that uh, no existing uncoated exterior wall finish uh, can be coated, or in this case, painted. Um, and I highlighted the subsection G, because uh, that's where it gets really specific as to when a variance uh, can be approved. And so I, there's a lot of text on this, on this slide, and I actually shortened it quite a bit. Uh, you know, there's seven uh, criteria uh, related to that there's a, there's a maintenance condition, um, or that you need this coding to, to correct uh, an issue. Um, and that, uh, you know, that there's a, a special type of, uh, type of paint uh, that would be used. Uh, so suffice it to say, it, it's very specific to there being uh, an issue with uh, the exterior material. And under those circumstances, uh, the Planning Commission and Council could consider uh, granting a variance. We don't feel like that these criteria are met uh, there doesn't seem to be any existing condition uh, that is causing deterioration or something unique uh, to that brick compared to what we see throughout the city. Uh, it certainly isn't old. Uh, 20 years old is, is pretty young in the lifespan of a brick. Uh, for reference, the Target store across the street, I believe, was built in the 60s. And that's kind of where the, the non-coding brick or better standard originated. And that, that's from the 60s. And, uncoated and still in great condition. Uh, so brick is a very durable exterior and we, and painting it actually reduces its durability. So, so touching on the reasons we, uh, we do not allow uh, coating, you know, Bloomington, you know, it's not a, a it's not a, a pretty, not a very common uh, standard. You see, you do see buildings being painted in other communities, but the reason we feel it's inappropriate is uh, it does uh, require ongoing maintenance. And so once you paint a building, especially masonry, you're going to have to keep painting it. And with, if the a tenant uh, leaves and the property owner is not uh, very diligent on maintenance, 
it could be an eyesore in pretty short order, especially if the painting isn't done uh, well. Um, so in addition to uh, just a maintenance thing, it also reduces the need to take enforcement action uh, due to property maintenance. When there's peeling paint or degraded materials because of you know, the um, certain water intrusion issues uh, that are associated with painting uh, 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 a, um, a breathing material like brick or some other type of masonry. So another thing we hear about, uh, you know, we have these conversations with uh, applicants or property owners about commercial buildings with some regularity. And sometimes we hear that the, the need to paint the brick is to meet a certain uh, image criteria established by the company. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the case in this particular application, but it is something that we hear and I thought it was worth referencing. And uh, the reason I have a, a different bank on the screen is that it's the same bank brand uh, that's under construction. And in this instance, they used, uh, they're using a, a lot of that reddish brick. Um, so it doesn't seem to be that the reddish brick, like at the Penn Avenue property, uh, is against the, the company's uh, color palette. Uh, that is something we'll hear when a company rebrands, uh, they have a certain color palette and that when you do a remodel, you have you absolutely have to stay within that, those the parameters of that color palette. Doesn't seem to be the case with this particular uh, company given they're building a brand new building with red brick. Further, there, there are options. Um, and, and that's something we, we focus on when we're looking at variances is are there are there alternatives, reasonable alternatives uh, to the variance or the need to the variance? And, and we think there are several good good options. So this is uh, what's at play here is brick veneer. It's not structural. Uh, it's really just a, a layer of brick on the exterior of a building. And so that can be replaced. Um, certainly it's more expensive. Uh, the easiest, uh, most cost effective way to change the color is to paint. Uh, so changing the brick would be a much more extensive a change in, in cost, but it is an option. Uh, the, the folks could also apply a stone tile or other sort of uh, concrete product uh, to the brick that usually apply, you know, um, requires the application of a, a lath and then another layer of like a, a cementitious <clears throat> coat before applying that stone or tile or concrete product. So it, it does bulk up the, the wall a little bit, but it certainly is an option. Uh, some folks actually apply stucco, uh, to a stucco system to the brick. That's been done at a couple of the hotels in Bloomington where similarly a different brand had a different color scheme and they, they, weren't, they didn't want the brick. Uh, so they actually uh, had a, a stucco system specific to a, a masonry sub, um, substructure uh, to, to meet their look. And then, you know, another option is to apply metal panels. Uh, you know, metal panels is a very popular exterior material, uh, and certainly that, that could be an option in this case. But we're, not, we're not saying how a building uh, should be designed or what the color scheme should be. Uh, we're less interested in color than we are the durability and the, the quality of the materials long term. So with that, we are recommending denial uh, of this variance. And uh, in your packet was the staff report that listed out all of the findings of fact. And uh, in order to approve a variance, all of those findings have to be met. And staff, we didn't feel that three of those findings were met. Uh, and I listed those A, C, and E. Uh, so we can go through those findings if you'd like, uh, but we are, we are recommending denial uh, and, and the recommended motion is before you. Thank you, Mr. Centenario. Um, <clears throat> Commissioners, any questions for um, staff on this? Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Centenario, does stucco installation on top of brick increase maintenance, similar to the way in which paint would to brick? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, you know, it's uh, not to the same level, uh, certainly. So if you apply stucco to brick, it's not, it's not like you're applying one individual coat of stucco finish directly to the brick, because uh, that likely wouldn't be very successful or, or durable long-term. Uh, the system, uh, the stucco system is again, where you have to apply a lath uh, to the brick. So the, the subsequent layers can adhere uh, to the wall. So it is a, it's, a, it's a system um, that a lot of the stucco manufacturers uh, uh, engineer uh, to be applied to a, a exterior masonry material. 
Uh, so, so it's more than just a thin layer of stucco. It's actually several layers based on an engineered system and is, is much more durable than paint. Thank you. Any additional questions for staff? Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I guess the question that I have is, um, in the previous application that we had that you referenced in your staff report, we were talking about uh, more of a varnish versus a paint. So it was more of a, like a dye um, versus a coating. Is that something that this is, or refresh my memory about that type of product and how it sure. applies to this application? Sure, uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, or Mr. Commissioner. Um, so I think one of the options that the previous variance application considered is a stain, a brick stain. And, uh, you know, when we have the, you know, the conversation with a, a property owner that, sorry, you, you wanted to paint your brick or your stone, but we don't allow that. Uh, we often hear the response, well, what about staining? And uh, staining is a coating, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't penetrate the entirety of the brick. It's really only a, a fraction of an inch uh, that it penetrates the, you know, the, the pores of, of the brick. Um, and actually staining it in some ways is worse than painting uh, because you, while it is very laborious and expensive to, re to remove paint from brick, you can do it. Whereas once you stain, you can't unstain uh, brick. Um, so uh, the standards are the same. The, the variance was the same in the, in the sense that it's a coating of a brick, uh, but the actual material that was gonna be used is different. Other questions, commissioners? Not seeing any. Um, why don't we go, uh, Mr. Markegard or Mr. Centenario? Is the applicant on with us tonight? Yes. Hi. No, oh. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, now, thank you very much for uh, all of the commentary and and the questions. I really appreciate it. Um, just the only the only kind of additional information that I can add is you know that we were. Uh, proposing is kind of a Stocorp um, top coat that is vapor permeable. It does, um, it, it's, it's kind of a, it adds for some superior protection to, you know, the brick itself there. Um, the only other, you know, item that I can add into that commentary is that the maintenance issue, if, if there's anything that we needed to do as far as, you know, keeping, you know, the, the materials working or keeping them up to standards, um, we would, you know, gladly do that or, you know, uh, kind of go however, however was recommended by uh, all of you. But I didn't really have much more commentary on that, but uh, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And just for the record, uh, your name is Zach Klobuchar. Is that correct? Yeah. Zach Klobuchar. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, commission, uh, commissioners, any questions for the applicant on this? All right, not seeing any. Thank you, uh, Zach, for your uh, testimony tonight. Um, commissioners, uh, next thing we'll go to public. So uh, Mr. Markergaard, at this time, we'll open the public hearing. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak to this item? Mr. Chair, we had nobody pre-register, but we'll check in here with Mr. Pease. Mr. Pease, do you have anybody on the line? There are no callers on the line. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pease. All right, Commission members, seeing nobody from the public willing or wanting to speak to this item tonight, is there a motion to close public hearing? Commissioner Roman? So moved. All right. We have a motion to close public hearing. Is there a second? Commissioner Goldsman? Second. All right, commission members, there is a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Discussion on that? Not seeing any. All those in favor of closing the public hearing say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman? Aye. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I, for myself, motion passes. The public hearing is now closed. 
Is there any discussion from commission members on this item? Maybe I'll start. I think uh, pretty clear in my mind, um, findings, uh, looking at the findings that Mr. Centenario provided, um, the variance really is created by the landowner and the desire to change the color. And uh, as well as one of the other issues, really just talking about, um, you know, the cost for replacing such. And um, we can't consider just the economic considerations alone um, for issuance of variances. So in my mind, uh, this is pretty clear cut um, to uh, recommend denial of a variance. Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am in agreement with your comments and with the staff's recommendation. This is a, a specific area of code where we've been pretty uh, consistent and pretty rigid about uh, sticking with. Um, you know, should there be an appetite by the council or members of the commission to revisit that in the future, um, we could. But from a variance standpoint, we have not issued variances for this purpose, and I'm not inclined to change that precedent at this time. So I, too, am supporting a denial. Thank you, Commissioner Rowan. Any other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I agree with the comments that have been already made. I. I Again, mentioned Richard Roman. He said uh, precedent. I think that's the word here. Um, and there have been other denials in the past. And to keep consistent, um, I too would, um, I would move to deny. Okay. Thank you. All right. Other commission members. Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion. Give everybody an opportunity to speak here, Commissioner Goldsman. Here, all right. I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead. All right. In case PL2021, having been able to, I'm sorry, in case PL2021-73, having been a, unable to make the required findings A, C, and E, I move to recommend City Council adopt a resolution denying the variance to paint brick exterior materials on an existing building at 7901 Penn Avenue. All right, thank you, Commissioner Goldsmith. Commissioners, we have a motion in front of us. Is there a second? Commissioner Albrecht? Second. All right, commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us to recommend the city council adopt a resolution denying the variance to paint brick and exterior materials on an existing building at 7901 Penn Avenue. Is there any further discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor of said motion, aye, by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman. Aye. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Cookton. Aye. And I for myself. Uh, motion passes. Now, this item will move forward to uh, the May 24th City Council. Uh, however, that is not a public hearing. So again, that will move forward to the May 24th City Council meeting. All right, thank you commissioners for that. Moving on to, <clears throat> excuse me, item number two. Uh, let's see, Miss O'Day, I believe you have a, is it a conditional use permit for us? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, item two on your agenda tonight is for a conditional use permit for an auto repair facility. <laughs> the address is 951 American Boulevard East. Uh, the site is just east of American Boulevard and Chicago Avenue intersection. Uh, surrounding uses mostly include other office warehouse uses. Um, Hakes Auto, they would occupy 4,800 square feet of the 18,000 square foot building. And the space would be located in the back of the building, highlighted in yellow on my screen. Uh, and then here's a photo on the bottom right hand uh, side of my screen of uh, a street image uh, looking at the building. Here's the floor plan of the subject tenant and the entire building. Hicks Auto would have four major, major auto repair bays and one minor auto repair bay. Um, 
Areas around the bays would be used for tool and equipment storage. There would be three interior parking spaces, which is included in the uh, total site for the parking, and then uh, 25 spaces within a fenced area uh, in the back of the site. Uh, just a couple items here. Parking is compliant with the auto repair use. However, any other um, use other than the office warehouse or expansion of an office must be reviewed for parking compliance. Um, and the landscaping is compliant and must continue to be maintained and the lighting is compliant as well. And then it should be noted that upon inspection, a wall pack has burnt out. So that should be replaced in order to um, keep compliance. And the space is tenant uh, or is move in ready. So building permits not needed at this time. Um, we are recommending approval on this item. I have not received any correspondence, and I believe that Eric Hake of Eric or of uh, Hake's Auto should be on the call for questions as well. All right, thank you, Mr. Day. Uh, commission members, any questions for Ms. O'Day? All right, not seeing any. Uh, uh, Mr. Hake, are you online with us tonight? Do you have anything to add to Ms. O'Day's staff report? Looks like you may be on mute still. There we go. Uh, no, I did not have nothing to add to it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hake. All right, at this time, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Markegaard, is there anybody uh, online that would wish to speak to this item? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, nobody has pre-registered, but we'll check in with Mr. Pease for any callers. Uh, Mr. Pease, is anybody on the line? Uh, there's no callers on the line, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pease. <clears throat> All right, commission members seeing Nobody from the public at this point that uh, would like to speak to this item. I'd entertain a motion to close public hearing. Commissioner Albrecht. I'll move. All right. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. We have a motion to close public hearing. Is there a second? Commissioner Goldsman. Second. All right. Commission members, we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Any further discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goltz? Aye. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Crookton? Aye. And I for myself, public hearing is now closed on this conditional use permit item. Commission members, any thoughts or uh, discussion on this item? Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think this is a pretty straightforward application and I appreciate that it's a locally owned business. So supporting a local uh, business owner starting up. So uh, I'll be in support of this application as it's presented tonight. Thank you, Commissioner Goldsman. Any further discussion? Commissioner Roman. I too will echo that. Um, appreciate the application, straightforward. Uh, great your use of the facility. I wish them well and much success. Um, and if others have comments, I'll wait to see if there's more hands. Otherwise, I'd be happy to make a motion. All right, not seeing any further hands raised. Ms. Uh, Commissioner Roman, go ahead and uh, if you'd like to make a motion. Thank you. In case PL 2021-74, having been able to make the required findings, I move to adapt a resolution approving a conditional use permit for a four bay auto repair facility in an existing office slash warehouse structure at 951 American Boulevard East, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. All right, thank you, Commissioner Roman. All right, Commissioner members, we have a motion in front of us. Is there a second? Commissioner Corman? Second. All right, Commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us to recommend to adopt the resolution approving a conditional use permit Four bay auto repair facility in an existing office warehouse structure at 951 American Boulevard, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Is there any further discussion? Not seeing any. 
those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman. Aye. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Cookton. Aye. And I, for myself, motion passes. All right, that item is a final decision unless an appeal is received by 4.30 on May 18th. So moving on to item number three for the Planning Commission tonight, we have Mr. Johnson uh, <clears throat> with an application from Walzer Toyota. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Can you hear me okay? We sure can. Great. I will jump right into it. Um, there's a number of applications associated or requests, I should say, associated with this development application submitted to you by Walzer Toyota. Um, the subject sites are 4217 and up, oh, excuse me, 4401 American Boulevard West. We'll get to a location map here in a minute. Just to provide an overview of what they're asking uh, of you this evening to consider uh, a comprehensive plan amendment to reguide 4217 American Boulevard West, the site of the former Sensors restaurant, from the community commercial designation to the regional commercial designation, uh, rezoning the northern portion of that same site from uh, commercial service 0 0.5 PD to C1 uh, PD and preliminary and final development plans uh, for their new dealership and corporate office uh, facility and associated parking ramp, and then a plat, uh, both preliminary and final, to combine those two sites. Here's the subject property. Uh, many of you were on the board uh, last year when they came through with their request, so you should be fairly familiar with this site, uh, but for those who are not, um, the site is just to the west of France Avenue along American Boulevard uh, West and of course 494 uh, directly to the north there. Um, there's an office use to the west. There is a condominium building to the southwest of the Walzer Toyota site. Um, again, 4401, that's the existing dealership. Uh, and then the, the sensor site, the 4217 American Boulevard just to the east of Walzer Toyota. Um, that restaurant is now uh, vacant. Um, Walzer Toyota had an opportunity to acquire that site and it made them rethink their plans to redevelop uh, their dealership facility at this location. Um, just to note the other surrounding uses to the east, the Denny's restaurant and the American uh, Hotel, uh, that's actually part of an existing plan development with sensors and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. Uh, and then to the south, uh, you have Wanda Miller Pond as well as single family residential neighborhoods. Uh, in the area. Getting you just an oblique image of uh, kind of the subject area. Um, uh, not much to add here on this slide, just to provide you kind of a zoomed in uh, oblique look at the site. Just to note that there is an existing uh, vegetated uh, or wooded boundary along the southern portions of these sites. That's consistent with the Walzer site. Um, uh, it also applies to the sensor site. Uh, so you can see that the existing dealership is on the west side of the site um, and the surface parking is in the center and east. And uh, as far as the sensor site goes, the restaurant fronts up on uh, American that would be demolished uh, and there's surface parking behind, um, which is some of which is shared with the plan development to the east. So getting to a little bit of background, uh, maybe more so on this application than others, some of the site history is uh, fairly relevant to staff's analysis and in terms of the, the policy decisions the city makes as it pertains to this application. Um, there's, a, there's a long history of uh, motor vehicle sales uses in Bloomington, as well as uh, kind of different city code provisions that have been adopted uh, to, to react and kind of stay ahead of. Uh, that uh, that desired use along such a, a high volume and prominent roadway like Interstate 494 and 35W, of course. Uh, so in terms of what has happened here at the Walzer Toyota site over time, uh, that dealership was established in 1999 under different ownership. It replaced the uh, Lincoln Dell. Um, uh, the first expansion of the site occurred in 2004 and very similar to what you're seeing tonight, that also involved a reguiding uh, request to reguide to uh, a, uh, a land use designation that would allow for automobile sales. And we'll talk about uh, what what um, designations allow auto sales versus which don't. Uh, but that original uh, application was premised on the basis of expanding uh, surface parking. And as you'll see with our C1 zoning district standards and 
some of our other performance standards for motor vehicle sales. Um, with respect to the history of the, the more recent uh, code provisions that have been adopted, it's really focused on wanting to see uh, commensurate levels of uh, building area and employment expand in addition to site expansions. Um, so whereas, you know, just a, a surface parking might be very valuable inventory uh, storage for an automobile sales, it doesn't increase substantially the amount of building area or employment associated with these facilities. So it's a tricky balance of making these facilities obviously successful. They need a certain amount of inventory on site to be successful. Uh, but the city's interest is to ensure that these highly visible and valuable sites along uh, you know, our most traveled roadways um, are centers for employment and economic activity and jobs. So that's the, that's really the balance of what the crux of that issue is. Um, so this uh, expansion in 2004, it was approved, premised. Uh, it was initially actually uh, going down the track of a denial, uh, but uh, the applicant withdrew in order to build a more substantial facility. There, there was a preliminary development plan that included a five-story dealership building. Uh, at that time. So the the uh, comprehensive plan amendment was approved contingent upon a future approval of final development plans uh, for that, you know, future more substantial uh, dealership and office facility and that never came to pass. Um, so in 2006 uh, revised final development plans were adopted uh, that did involve the expansion of the surface parking. Uh, the city did not uh, achieve uh, the expansion of the dealership the way that they originally envisioned it. And, um, you know, Walzer can certainly speak for themselves. I think that they ideally would have uh, pursued that um, expansion in the dealership, but for whatever reason, whether it be construction costs or other market considerations as it pertains to motor vehicle sales, uh, they did not pursue that expansion at that time. So um, that's relevant to tonight's discussion because we'll talk about, again, this is another project that has, uh, it's a phased construction plan and I will present that to you in a minute. Um, but there's, uh, well, with what we're talking about in the staff report, as well as in tonight's presentation, it again goes back to that um, uh, key factor of commensurate expansion of employment and building floor area uh, in addition to expansion of land area. And we'll talk uh, more about that. So. Um, the image that I have on the slide for you, that's just uh, the image from 2003. So you see kind of the previous condition of what occurred at the dealership uh, prior to that 2004 expansion. And that did replace uh, grandma's saloon in Delhi. Uh, and then you see sensors here on the east side of that slide. So that just shows you kind of how the expansions occurred uh, over the years. And then uh, more recently, so the um, Walzer Toyota has been pursuing uh, the redevelopment of this site uh, for you know a little over five years, um, and that that there's there's a variety of reasons for that. I believe it's a very high performing store uh, for them in their company, um, so they do want to expand the sales and uh, other capacities, uh, repair and other capacities of the the facility and location that they have here today in order to build on that success. Uh, but also they have, and you know, the, this the, the devil's in the details of all this stuff. But they have uh, requirements with uh, corporate Toyota, you know, national Toyota, as to what types of specifications that their dealerships uh, have to have in order to continue to maintain that flag um, uh, of selling their 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 product, for lack of a better term. And so there's multiple reasons kind of driving uh, their desire to get this redevelopment done. Um, and uh, they haven't landed on a plan that they have pursued up to this point. Just a little bit of more background in 2016. Uh, this was the first final development plan that was approved uh, more recently. Um, this, you can see that on the left side of the slide. Uh, this was a two-story dealership and a five-story parking ramp lined along the southern portion of the site with surface parking in the north. This plan never came to pass uh, because it could not have been phased in a way uh, to keep the existing dealership uh, fully in operation uh, during the construction process. It's very important to Walzer to stay in business uh, during the construction process. And then this, this uh, plan you see here on the right side of the slide, this is the plan that the Planning Commission considered last summer um, that you would be more familiar with. Uh, and uh, at that final development plan approval, uh, that also involved a rezoning to the C1. So we'll talk about that with the sensor site. Uh, but this was also a phased plan. And the whole purpose of this phasing was again, to keep the existing dealership, which is outlined in red, in business during construction. They would have built the first phase of the ramp uh, outlined in green there. 
in order to build in uh, employee and customer and uh, motor vehicle uh, parking supply um, so that they then could take over the eastern side of the site to build the new uh, dealership and office building. And then ultimately they would have demolished the existing dealership and constructed uh, the second phase of the uh, parking structure um, uh, in order to provide more uh, motor vehicle uh, inventory storage and uh, parking for the overall dealership. So this is the plan that they likely would have pursued had this opportunity to acquire the sensor site not uh, be come to pass. Um, and these final development plans are technically still valid um, and uh, uh, they would not expire um, until um, two years from the date that those were approved. So getting back to the sensors uh, site. So as I mentioned before, this uh, restaurant was developed in 1982 as part of a three lot plan development. Uh, and so you can see those parcels here outlined in the yellow boundary. And so when we have a scenario where we have a parcel in an existing plan development with other owners, um, depending on the physical changes being proposed, it's important to get some level of consent or support uh, from the adjoining property owners, particularly in a scenario where you have both shared access and parking in this case. And so um, there are different elements of uh, shared uh, parking and uh, access here. Um, uh, we've looked through the uh, voluminous case history of this plan development. Um, you know, the record keeping back then was probably not as uh, substantial as it is today, but from what we've gathered, um, the, the uh, sensor site would uh, be required to provide 19 parking stalls to the other parcels uh, in order to maintain their compliance with city code on the basis of today's standards. So that's just one thing to note. Um, and the Walzer has been diligent in working with the adjoining owners uh, in order to gain their consent. And included in your packet was uh, letters of consent submitted by Denny's and American to remove the sensors parcel from the uh, existing plan development on the assumption uh, and contingent upon that shared access and these 19 parking stalls continue to be provided. Um, and so that's that's what you'll see reflected in the plans is kind of that uh, arrangement or agreement that they have reached with these other parties. Getting to the comprehensive plan amendment request. So currently the sensor site is guided uh, community commercial. That is a land use designation that does not allow uh, automobile sales. So in order to expand the Walzer Toyota facility onto this uh, site over to the east, they have to re-guide uh, the site. And so in terms of the community commercial designation versus the regional commercial, as I said, community commercial does not allow automobile sales, whereas regional commercial is the only commercial category that does allow uh, for motor vehicle sales. Um, so that's really important. Um, the access considerations for regional commercial are the highest uh, in the city, meaning that they have to have direct access to arterial roadway or collector, as well as close proximity to uh, freeways. Excuse me. <coughs> so uh, this this site meets that access criteria. It's a uh, um, quarter mile or a little less than a quarter mile from Interstate 494, again, just to the west of France Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, is certainly on an arterial roadway uh, with American Boulevard. So kind of like a rezoning, what we look at with these uh, re-guiding requests is, you know, how is the how is the guiding changing? And certainly regional commercial is one step up uh, in commercial activity uh, in that it allows that motor vehicle sales use. Uh, the site does meet the access criteria. So that's another thing that we look at. And then finally, what we look at for both re-guidings and rezonings is what is the public benefit uh, associated with this project? You know, why should the city which uh, re-guide a parcel, which is the highest level of city discretion um, that we have uh, in our in our zoning toolbox, if you will, uh, or land use toolbox? And so what the public benefit associated with this project is that Walzer Toyota has committed to moving their corporate offices uh, from Edina. Uh, they, I believe they lease uh, office space uh, over in Edina, they would be relocating their corporate employees to this new uh, shared office and dealership building. Uh, and so Walzer, uh, between the increases of both sales and repair staff, but uh, also adding uh, this cor their corporate employees to uh, this facility in Bloomington, 
Walzer is currently estimating that this project would have a would in would um, include a range between 150 and 175 new jobs in Bloomington. Uh, so that's very significant uh, and um, uh, a sound public benefit uh, argument. Now we'll talk about the phasing again in a minute. The public benefit is based on uh, them providing that additional floor area as well as uh, that employment um, and performing on the plan as it's currently being shown. So we'll, we'll talk about phasing uh, agreements and performance agreements and things like that. Um, and again, I just hearken back to that history, as I mentioned it before, as to why this is a particular sticking point in uh, staff's analysis. So based on the project being shown to you, we are recommending approval of uh, reguiding the sensor site to the regional commercial designation. Um, if the, the project performs, um, it certainly has strong public benefit arguments and meets the other criteria for regional commercial. Getting to the rezoning, uh, we in the, with the action last uh, year that many of you were on the board for, we did rezone the existing Walzer uh, parcel from the CS uh, 0.5 zoning district to the C1 zoning district. The C1 district is a zoning district that was really developed uh, with automobile sales facilities in mind. It has specific performance standards and criteria within it that apply to motor vehicle sales facilities. Um, so. Um, Rezoning the sensor site to the C1 zoning district makes a lot of sense um, in terms of uh, um, compliance or consistency with the comp plan. If you reguide the sensor site to the regional commercial uh, designation, the C1 zoning district is certainly compatible uh, with that zoning or with that land use designation. So it certainly would be compatible with the comp plan um, in terms of uh, other benefits to going with the C1 district. Uh, the C1 zoning district has minimum floor area requirements for motor vehicle sales facilities. And so what those requirements state is that the uh, motor vehicle sales facilities can't decrease in FAR. They can certainly increase, uh, but they can't decrease. Um, and it does have minimum uh, criteria for expansions as well. So um, similar to reguiding, you do look at a public benefits argument. And again, just to reiterate, 150 to 175 new jobs in Bloomington is a substantial uh, public benefit. So we are recommending approval of the rezoning action as well. Um, just from a housekeeping standpoint, automobile sales technically is allowed in the CSO5 district, but as a conditional use. Uh, but the fact that the site is currently guided community commercial would not allow Walzer uh, to pursue a conditional use permit uh, without that reguiding action. So we do we do strongly support uh, going to a C1 zoning district. And again, this applies to the I should say state this applies to the northern uh, four fifths of the site. The southern 150 uh, feet of the site is zoned R1. It's a little bit odd or irregular that these sites are split zoning. Um, so the, the southern 150 feet of the sensor site would remain zoned R1. It was done that way to buffer those residential uses to the south. So we do recommend approval of rezoning uh, the northern four fifths of the sensor site to that C1 designation. Getting to those specific standards I mentioned in the C1. So there are minimum FAR requirements for motor vehicle sales in C1. Uh, it does state, and this is very applicable to this situation, when you have the expansion of a uh, new land area into a motor vehicle sales uh, facility, uh, the amount of building area that is added uh, in relation to the amount of land area that is added must meet a minimum 0 0.4, 0 0.4. In this case, Walzer is bringing uh, a project to you that would have a uh, expanded FAR or the FAR over the expansion area, the amount of the site that's being added with the sensor site of uh, 0 0.51. So it does meet that criteria. The overall FAR uh, of the um, development as a whole when complete would increase as well, and that would be 0.24. And uh, under these C1 standards, they wouldn't be allowed to uh, reduce that uh, further on down the line. Get into the specific phasing of this project. So this is your first look at the site plan. I will get into more comments about the site plan um, here just a little bit in a minute. Uh, but in terms of a phasing, and again, this all, all is uh, designed in a way or phased in a way to keep the existing facility in operation during construction. So the first phase would be to construct a three-story parking structure on the east side of the uh, total site on the sensor site. Uh, and again, that builds in a large amount of automobile uh, inventory storage as well as parking 
uh, and the purpose of which, uh, once they complete that, that allows them to um, uh, take up or remove all of the surface parking uh, that exists today that is needed to construct the new dealership building in phase two. The final phase would be to uh, demo the existing dealership building and construct uh, additional customer and uh, employee and service parking over on the west side of the site which can also act as automobile inventory as well. So just a note about that uh, project phasing. So from east to west, uh, phases one, two, and three. So again, based on this uh, uh, site history uh, that I mentioned, uh, something that the staff has been uh, keenly focused on throughout our conversation with Walzer um, is the idea of uh, um, completing this project and performing uh, on the full extent of the final development plans being shown to you this evening. Uh, Walzer has been receptive to staff's concerns. They've been, um, uh, they have uh, paid them due respect throughout the process, I would, I would say. And, uh, and through our kind of collaborative discussions about what are ways that Walzer can demonstrate and, and uh, ensure performance, uh, in other words, that the the, uh, what occurred in the mid 2000s with respect to previous expansions does not occur again. And Walzer has put forth a proposal that staff uh, is supportive of and does think will achieve ultimately the end goal of uh, ensuring performance in this case. And so if you uh, read through Wal Walzer's written materials um, in the uh, attached to the staff report, they did put forth a proposal. And more specifically, this all relates to the use of the sensor site. And so what it's proposing is that use of the sensor site uh, initially is only allowed on an interim basis, a two year period, and that would be contingent upon, in other words, they couldn't start uh, utilizing it for that purpose until uh, issuance of the dealership office building permit. So they would have to submit for and get approval of uh, the building permit uh, for the new dealership and office building and then proof of deposit on major structural elements. So major structural elements that includes the steel, the other building materials that have to be uh, cast and uh, manufactured in order to uh, construct the building. So typically when you acquire, when you put in orders for those types of materials, they typically uh, require pretty substantial deposits on that type of material. So that's what would trigger the first initial uh, uh, interim use uh, period, that two year period, and then permanent use of the sensor site would be allowed after the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the dealership office building. That would cement uh, use of the, the sensor site in conjunction with uh, the Walzer Toyota uh, overall site and facility. Um, there is some built in flexibility uh, for unseen delays with respect to building materials or other or other things uh, that may occur, it would be up to the discretion as it's currently drafted to the community development director whether to allow any extension of that interim use two year period. And again, it would have to be on the basis of walls are demonstrating that they're making substantial progress. Um, in addition to this element of the kind of use restrictions of the sensor site. Uh, Walzer is to provide the city with written commitments. Uh, some of those have already been provided uh, to, to us. The, the commitment from Walzer was in your packet with respect to relocating uh, their, their corporate jobs to the city of Bloomington. Uh, in addition to that, they have provided staff uh, some, uh, some documents from uh, Toyota National uh, that pertain to um, their requirements as to redeveloping their facility to a more modern facility. Uh, again, it relates to that issue I brought up before about the flag and the requirements to, to uh, be allowed to um, be a dealer for Toyota. And then finally, just uh, additional assurances from uh, Walzer's uh, financial institutions that they're able to perform uh, for the whole uh, project. So some of those things have been provided on an initial basis. And those are just things that would need to be cemented um, uh, prior to the project going forward. So now um, that it took me a long time to get here. I apologize, but uh, the so now here is the site plan before you. This is the full uh, build of the project upon completion of all three phases of construction. So again, on the east side of the site, you do have phase one. You have the three-story parking structure with roof parking. Um, in the central portion of the site, you have the three-story dealership building. Uh, just to note that the southern 
portion of the building is uh, one story. Uh, it's really the northern half of the building that has the three story uh, components and then surface parking on the west as well as to the north of the building and north of the parking structure. Access uh, to this site uh, remains relatively similar to as it is today. There's one existing dealership for Walzer Toyota that would just be shifted just slightly. Um, and then the shared access in the northeast portion of the site also remains. Um, Walzer's intention with these site plans is uh, to provide you a code complying uh, project as much as feasible. There's just a few minor <coughs> excuse me, minor uh, inconsistencies with city code that we've identified. They do need to add some parking islands, mid row parking islands in this uh, parking tier north of this of the dealership buildings and parking uh, structure. Um, in addition, they have to provide an eight foot sidewalk along uh, American Boulevard West. That's a standard along arterial or collector roads. Um, so they do need to provide a continuous walk and they're working with the engineering and traffic div division on the correct alignment for that. Um, in terms of that, uh, I do have the demolition plan available too, but um, they are, per are, are going to provide some stormwater management facilities in the southern portion of the site expanded. Um, but they are, you know, there's no or very little disturbance to that southern uh, vegetated uh, berm and buffer uh, along Wanda Miller Pond. I know in previous iterations of this development, that has been a concern on the part of the neighborhood to the south that that berm be maintained. Um, and uh, this project does not uh, does not propose uh, disruption uh, to that ex existing uh, um, factor or amenity. Um, that's the general uh, site plan. I think those are the key things I wanted to touch on. We'll uh, keep moving on here to the building design. Um, so again, the three-story uh, building and the northern half of the uh, facility, there's a lot of glass on the northern elevation, uh, proposing glass and metal panels and architectural concrete uh, panels. Um, so those are all code compliant materials. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about structure height in a bit, uh, but um, just to note the, the parking ramp is also proposed out of uh, having some metal panel accents as well as uh, mostly architectural concrete. Um, there is a request made by Walzer to allow for some cable railings along the north uh, elevation. I will have a slide touching on what uh, PD flexibilities they are requesting with their application. Uh, but this just provides you a uh, general building design and uh, highlights the different building materials that they're proposing to build this facility out of. Uh, just to note, they are currently proposing to show a skyway in between the parking structure on the second level of the parking ramp to the, the dealership building. Get into the building elevations themselves. I kind of touched on the materials, so I uh, probably don't need to spend any more time on that. Um, these are the building elevations of the proposed parking ramp. In terms of the floor plan, uh, I have the northern half of uh, the ground level blown up here on the right side of the slide. This is where the uh, the crux or the primary sales activities would be occurring, would be in the northern portion of the ground level of the facility. Uh, on the west side, you can see the kind of the service galley or where you would drive your vehicle in in order to meet a uh, associate or representative to uh, to communicate and deliver for uh, vehicle service. Um, there is a part storage uh, component on the ground level as well. If you look on the left side of the slide, the southern portion of the first level is all the uh, modern repair bays that they're proposing here, 45 in total, 30 of which would be major repair bays and uh, 15 of which would be minor repair bays. On the southwest corner of the site is where the facility car wash would be located. Uh, something just as it pertains to noise uh, to be aware of for uh, Walzer in terms of when, you know, preparing architectural plans for baffling and other things. So that's the crux of the uh, the ground level of the facility. Uh, the second and third level have uh, more office oriented uses. There is more part storage on level two here as shown. Other than that, it, it does provide, uh, it also provides the uh, locker room and employee areas uh, for all their staff. And then there's uh, quite a bit of conference and training spaces on the second level. And then getting to the third level itself, you have uh, offices lining the west wall, more conference and training lining the east wall, and then open open office call, uh, concept uh, throughout the remainder of the uh, top floor, the third floor. <laughs> Excuse me. 
got a frog in my throat all night tonight. I apologize. Getting to uh, building height. So similar to the uh, zoning issue with split zoning on these sites, this site actually has split uh, height designations on it. So the northern portion of the site has a no limit height designation. The southern 300 feet has a uh, three story or 50 foot uh, height uh, limitation. And that does uh, a factor that is applicable to the southern portions of the parking structure and the dealership building. And I'll get into that here. Um, in terms of the heights associated with these structures, on the top part of the slide is the uh, motor, uh, is the dealership and office building. So at the tallest portion of that part of the facility, you're looking at just under 50 feet in height. Um, just to note the portion that is, uh, I guess, in closer proximity to the residential uh, areas to the south, that portion of the building is uh, 25 feet, just under 25 feet in height. And then you get into the parking structure. Uh, the majority of the parking structure is around uh, 46 and a half feet uh, in height. Uh, there are some stair towers, um, the, the stair tower, and which includes that uh, second level skyway, um, that more substantial stair tower that does rise to a height of 57 uh, feet in height or just under 58 feet. Again, that's in the northern portion where there is no limit on the southern portion. They are proposing a stair tower that gets to 52 and a half feet in height. So that would be uh, a deviation and I'll, I'll chat more on that just here in a minute, but just wanted to highlight the structure heights proposed with this facility. Getting to parking um, uh, at a motor vehicle sales facility, it's uh, often the case or common that they far exceed our parking requirements for these uses because uh, certainly they have a keen interest to provide a lot of motor vehicle inventory. And in some cases, in terms of the design, particularly the uh, parking structure, you know, in some cases they have double loaded stalls or they have uh, drive aisles that are a little bit narrower than our typical. That is allowed uh, based on the fact that we consider this to be vehicle storage as opposed to customer employee parking. Uh, that being said, on that basis, the Walzer would be responsible to provide staff a, a detail, detailed signage and striping plan for where all motor vehicle inventory is to be stored versus customer employee parking, vehicles awaiting repair, uh, kind of designating the different areas um, so that we have a, an understanding uh, of how to apply what standards to each one of these stalls. Um, in terms of the actual parking requirement under code, it'd be 385 parking spaces. They're showing uh, just under 1500 uh, parking spaces between the uh, surface parking and the ramp parking. Um, so just to, to note about that, they far exceed the code requirement. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, designated spaces of inventory versus customer employee, obviously they have to maintain the code requirement at a minimum level um, for the customer employee and the repair uh, parking spaces. The rest can be inventory. It's up to Walzer how they want to designate that so long as uh, it meets other code requirements. Um, the right part portion of my slide just to highlight here. So I spoke earlier about the existing plan development that the sensor site is in. Um, so staff did analysis of that, uh, of those existing approvals and existing, uh, or I, I should say previous approvals and those existing uses and did determine that they uh, would need to provide 19 parking stalls to ensure that the Denny's restaurant and the American Hotel are still compliant with today's uh, code requirements for uh, off-street parking supply. And so that's what's being shown to you here in the yellow highlighted stalls is that Walzer would dedicate these 19 stalls located on the sensor site. Uh, to the adjoining properties to the east. And then the stalls in orange, these are actually existing parking stalls that exist today. Uh, the Walzer and, or I should say on the sensor site and the hotel site, and this again harkens back to their, uh, the history of their approval, but they had a, uh, a 10 stall shared parking easement in this location that allowed the hotel and the restaurant to share those spaces. So they're proposing to keep that agreement in place. Uh, and that's why those stalls remain there. In terms of the landscape plan, they are showing a code compliant amount of uh, landscaping uh, at this project. Um, so the quantities are good. Uh, two small things, uh, a couple parking islands are missing um, the necessary trees the code requires. So they would need to uh, correct that. And our uh, the city supplemental landscaping policy does require that uh, buildings facing public frontages have 50% uh, of those foundations have foundation plantings. So currently they're not showing any landscaping along the front side of the dealership and office building. So they would need to provide some small uh, beds or some plantings in those areas. 
Um, one other comment about landscaping in our previous review uh, in uh, last year, uh, the representative of the Fountain Lake uh, condominiums uh, development did request that evergreen plantings be provided along this uh, western boundary. Now, obviously, with that previous application, the, the parking structure was located much closer uh, to that boundary than uh, this current plan. Uh, but that being said, I, I guess they are showing evergreens in that location. Um, so I think that they are uh, attempting to meet the intent or kind of honor that previous request. But, um, you know, if, if there's an ability to increase the density of that, I'm sure Fountain Lake would uh, would appreciate that. So that's my comments about landscaping. Getting to that height deviation, so there's only two deviations associated with this uh, uh, application that Walzer is requesting, as opposed to just non-conforming issues that just need to be corrected. And so one of them has to do with uh, this uh, modest uh, encroachment into the maximum height requirement at the southern portion of the parking ramp. So if you see on the left side of the slide, these, this is the dealership building and the parking structure and uh, what I outlined in green is those are the portions of those structures that comply with the city's maximum height requirements. It's only this small stair tower in the southeast corner of the parking structure uh, that would not comply. And that's again on the basis of uh, ex or exceeding that maximum height requirement by two and a half feet. So it's very uh, modest or minor, um, both in vertical encroachment, but also in uh, the overall area. We're talking about a 262 square foot area. It's just the stair tower. Uh, and what informs that is that Walzer certainly could provide an unenclosed uh, stair tower and meet the height requirement, uh, but it's their position and staff is supportive of that, that uh, an enclosed stair tower provides just a safer uh, facility for their staff and for other people who would be utilizing it. Um, I mean, you just think about uh, kind of uh, stairs that get slippery in winter conditions or um, other safety concerns with an unenclosed stair tower. Uh, as well as uh, in uh, you know additional noise as well. So um, staff is uh, supportive of this modest encroachment. Um, it's very small, both in height and in the, the area that it actually is applicable. Um, and we do think that there is uh, a public safety or a, a, a user safety element uh, to supporting it. In terms of uh, this cable railings request, so technically uh, for parking structures, parking structures have to be designed in a way that blocks vehicle headlights. And this came up with their request last year as well. Uh, but it's as it turns out, the vehicles that face American Boulevard and uh, 494 uh, for Walzer, those are really intended to be uh, display vehicles or showpieces that uh, obviously advertise their product, uh, but let people know um, uh, what what is uh, being sold here. Uh, so having a three foot uh, wall on this side certainly would block a portion of those vehicles and not allow for that uh, vehicle display, uh, which many motor vehicle sales desire along a, a frontage like 494 and American. Um, so they've they've communicated to staff that these vehicles are likely to not move um, um, a terrible uh, amount. And so when we're thinking about blocking headlights, obviously it's vehicle movements, um, number one. But also, you know, uh, thinking about uh, the elevation of those vehicles and what they're shining out uh, onto, you know, 494 is a good distance away from where this, this structure will be. Uh, and then at, at such a height that it really should not provide uh, a substantial disturbance. So if these vehicles are not moving uh, very often and there's not a, a neighbor that can be negatively impact, impacted, uh, staff is uh, supportive of uh, foregoing the, the vehicle headlight screening uh, just on this northern elevation. So what we've recommended to you is a, re is a condition that vehicle headlights be screened uh, per the code requirement on all building elevations of the parking structure except the northern elevation. The plat is fairly self-explanatory. Again, just combining those two parcels, they would have to comply with all the standard conditions and um, requirements of any plat, park dedication, uh, providing the necessary easements um, and those types of things. So just work with our engineering staff um, to pursue that. In terms of operational requirements, this is uh, there are specific performance standards and code for motor vehicle sales facilities. So. Just to put all these on the record, um, noise as it pertains to noise, they, they can't use public address systems, they can't use panic alarms to locate vehicles. Um, there's there's restrictions and other sections of the city code that have to do with sustained amounts of noise throughout the day. 
And so uh, I hearken back to my comment about the car wash. Car washes can be notorious for uh, being high noise generators. And so uh, I would urge the, the architect and their design team to look at ways at mitigating that noise requirement. Um, and I believe we identified that code section in, in uh, city code. So if they wanted to look at that or have an acoustical uh, expert look at that um, uh, to ensure that they remain in compliance of that. Um, in terms of vehicle repair, vehicle repair cannot uh, occur outside. It has to occur within the enclosed facility and uh, vehicles awaiting repair have to be, uh, you know, parked and stored in correct locations. I don't believe they intend to do auto body at this site, but if there are vehicles awaiting auto body repair, they would need to be screened from adjoining properties and uh, the public frontage as well. Um, vehicle storage and display, vehicles are not allowed to be parked on landscape yards or uh, green areas of the site. Um, just a heads up in that regard. Um, test driving in the area has to stick to, um, I uh, cannot go on local residential streets. Um, you know, in this location, that would be an unlikely uh, scenario anyway, but um, just to state that code clearly prohibits that um, uh, from occurring. And uh, vehicle loading and loading, there are restrictions in terms of time uh, of when vehicles can be loaded on and loaded on the basis of this site being located in proximity to residential uses. So those are things that they'd have to abide by on an ongoing basis. Other miscellaneous issues, you know, lighting is always a big issue with car dealerships. It's never a matter of compliance that you typically far exceed the code requirement for security uh, reasons. Um, staff would urge them to uh, try and lower the proposed lighting uh, level that they are showing, although uh, staff will be diligent at ensuring that they have the necessary 90 degree cutoff fixtures uh, that city code requires um, to ensure dark sky. Uh, design just to note the lighting on top of the um, structure parking structure is only 12 feet in height so that's a positive thing in terms of um, uh, and its effect on surrounding properties um, the a trash and recycling storage uh, facility was not identified in the architectural plans they do need to have interior uh, trash and recycling storage so that's just an uh, architectural update and uh, um, as per always with all developments, uh, any rooftop mechanical equipment must be screened to adjoining uh, streets and sidewalks. So we have received two emails on this project. One email, uh, I believe both residents of Fountain Lake condos, but uh, one of the emails uh, noted concerns about the traffic levels on American Boulevard, uh, specifically requesting uh, that the city consider uh, deploying a traffic signal at what's 80th Street Circle. Um, and uh, the second email noting concerns about uh, operational activities or uh, kind of traffic activities on West 80th Street Circle, because um, that's that's the road that uh, um, serves the Fountain Lake condos. So um, we traffic staff has looked at American Boulevard, um, you know, overall, I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves, but um, I believe Brian Hansen's on the call if there's questions, but uh, overall, the traffic uh, um, generation by this development, uh, when you consider the, the existing restaurant, the existing dealership, it, it close, close to comes out to a wash, believe it or not, with the new facility, uh, replace the expanded facility replacing the existing facility in the existing restaurant. So I have spoken for a long time. I apologize about that. I hope I wasn't getting too far into the weeds. Um, but uh, we do recommend approval of these applications uh, subject to a number of conditions. I do have recommended motions and I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Jensen. Uh, commission commissioners, any uh, questions for Mr. Johnson after his thorough presentation? <laughs> oh yeah, we got some. All right, uh, I, I don't know uh, who was first there. Commissioner Crookdown, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you spoke about the public benefit of adding a certain number of jobs with this application. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I was wondering if when the city um, looks at that, when we're determining public benefit or not, if it accounts for the number of jobs that may be lost due to the restaurant going away. Yeah, Chairman Solberg, Commissioner Cookton, that's a, that's a fair comment um, for sure. Uh, I, d I don't know offhand the full extent of the employment at the Sensors restaurant. Obviously, it's a larger restaurant, so I would imagine that uh, the employment of uh, the Sensors restaurant was not insubstantial, so I don't want to gloss over that. 
uh, associated with relocating uh, the the walls or corporate jobs to the area. Um, uh, it, it exceeds the number uh, of the existing employment of uh, the Sensors Restaurant would be my guess. Uh, but in addition to that, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I, I guess the, the office jobs, particularly in suburban markets are some of the most uh, hard or desirable jobs to capture at this moment, particularly in a, a market that a suburban market that has seen some softening uh, in favor of more of the urban core centers. Um, so if, if there's an opportunity to do that, um, and, and I think secondarily, uh, what I'd say is that, uh, you know, relocating a substantial number of office jobs tend to really buttress and support uh, the local retail and service uh, markets as well, uh, because there's a pretty substantial domino effect. If, you know, pending post pandemic world, people are going to be traveling in Bloomington, shopping in Bloomington and, and utilizing other restaurants and services in Bloomington. Uh, so I think jobs like these ones uh, tend to have a fairly significant domino effect or kind of snowballing uh, uh, nature to them, uh, which is uh, substantial. So. Thank you. Right, uh, Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to uh, Commissioner Cook. John, that was one of my exact questions, uh, so appreciate that. Um, my other question is regarding the in and out on American Boulevard, and I um, tried to look there at the site plan, but Mr. Johnson, um, it looks as though the in and out on American Boulevard is decreasing in width. Can you confirm that that is the case? Yeah, Chairman Solberg, Commissioner Albrecht, that's correct. The Western driveway is narrowing. Uh, currently they have a two lane, uh, uh, two lanes of traffic on the inbound west hand side. So I'm talking about the Western driveway. And then there's one outbound lane on the east side, but they also have this uh, median, which they, you know, typically have put uh, signage and other uh, elements in that median area. So you're correct that in the new site plan that would narrow just to two. Um, if I'm going back to the site plan here, apologize. That would uh, that would narrow down to that two, uh, just two travel lanes, one inbound, one outbound. Uh, and they are proposing to, I believe, construct a, a new sign on the west side. Um, uh, in that parking island. So you're correct that it is narrowing. Thank you. All right, other commissioners with questions? Otherwise, uh, a couple for you, Mr. Johnson. And just because you did refer, I think, uh, changes from the previous application that was before us. Um, you referred to lighting on the on the roof and it's at 12 feet. Is that the minimum height or maximum height for lighting on the roof of the facility? Yeah, yeah thank you for that question. Um, actually, lighting would typically lighting is limited either by use as well as proximity to residential. So even if they were subject to our standard of uh, being in close proximity to residential, which I believe uh, Londell could correct me, I believe it's within 300 feet or so. Um, but uh, they, the maximum height that they could go to potentially would be 33 feet. And if, if they were uh, held to that more strict standard, then the maximum height would be 28 feet. And that goes to the height of the luminaire, the tallest portion of the pole and the light all at 28 feet. So 12 feet is a substantial, I mean, typically what it will require is that they have more lights um, to light the, if they intend to light the entire uh, parking area, um, it'll require more lights because um, there's less distribution. Uh, but a, a lower luminaire uh, will be less impactful or less uh, um, less nuisance characteristic, I guess I'd say. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. I just wanted to clarify because I know that was an issue uh, of discussion in our last uh, application on this particular process. But then uh, the next question I really have for you is really about, you mentioned the noise uh, and the car wash associated with that. Just want to clarify because we have had some of these acoustical issues uh, brought up in past applications. Clarify uh, who is responsible for uh, enforcing any noise ordinance uh, or any issues associated with that, um, uh, any noise from the facility. 
Yeah, thank you, Chairman Solberg. It would be the city's environmental health uh, division. So if there was a complaint, they would investigate it. Uh, the city has equipment, acoustical equipment that they can take readings and measures uh, with respect to acoustics. So what they would be uh, going out there to do is to confirm whether or not um, the, the noise levels of that facility are exceeding the, uh, it's called the L10. That's like uh, more than 10 minutes in any given hour um, standard beyond a certain decibel level. Uh, for that type of facility. So um, they would go out there, they would take readings, they would work with Walzer um, uh, to, to establish what the noise levels were. And then if they were not in compliance, Walzer would have to uh, do some mitigation on some level. Okay. And then just one final one. I, I appreciate uh, the site plan. I don't know if you could show the landscaping plan and I just want to verify that as that moves forward, um, and what I've understood from previous uh, auto storage locations, um, are those trees on the islands we're talking about in this particular landscape plan versus uh, bushes? I want to make sure because I know we've had feedback on that in the past. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Solberg. Code requires trees be planted in islands so they're not um they're not shrubs there are shrubs in some islands to be sure uh but um yes we have gotten that feedback uh, particularly on inventory only lots um that you know that it can create some uh dust or uh, debris or other uh, nuisance characteristics for uh, vehicles um, obviously they're trying to make them look sharp <laughs> so that you walk off the lot with them right um so i'm sure that that's not uh their desired favorite, but it's a code requirement and it's something that uh, staff would not recommend we uh, forego in any way. No, and I just wanted to make sure that we are talking trees here. And I know we've talked about this in the past about uh, heat islands and such and had applicants that uh, insisted, I think, uh, opposite of what the applicant did here tonight. So thank you for answering those questions. Uh, yeah. Chairman, if I yes, go ahead. Chairman, if, if I may make point, your your comment about your comment about lighting spurred one other uh, just thought pattern that I wanted to raise that I forgot in my presentation. But if you consider the plan that was approved last year, you know, with the the parking structure more in the southwest corner of the site, uh, while it you know it, it may affect uh, different properties differently, uh, but if you recall, if I go to an aerial photo here. Uh, you know, the, the portion of the site that's closest to the single family neighborhood to the south is that southwest portion. Um, so if you if you just look at this general area, you've got these kind of properties right across the channel. Um, you know, certainly there's still properties that will be able to see these structures without a doubt. I'm not going to pretend that. Uh, but moving that uh, parking structure to the east side of the site uh, from my uh, in my judgment does uh, kind of lessen some of that immediate uh, building massing and structure impact uh, that I think was uh, maybe a, a kind of more substantial on the west side of the site, if that makes sense. In addition to Fountain Lake condos also being over there as well. So I just wanted to make that point. Yes, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the things that I had a question about is a uh, minimum set within this district. So I know in a lot of the other applications that we've seen, we like to have the building as far forward to the property line to the north as possible to that street. And I see that this is set back. So what is the setback for this district and how does that apply to this, this uh, new development plan? Yeah, thank you for that question. Chairman Solberg, Commissioner Goldsman. Um, I believe it's, I'm trying to make sure I give you the right number so I don't give you the wrong, I don't want to give you the wrong number. Um, the front setback uh, required in the C1 district is 35 feet. So that's a that's a minimum uh, setback requirement. Uh, they could have this building located further uh, to the north, without a doubt, they could do that. Um, but I think it has, I think it has more to do with their construction phasing and um, uh, than than so much of uh, you know and front field parking probably some inventory uh, would be my guess as well um, but I believe that uh, part of it somewhat has to do with uh, construction phasing as well so it's a 35 foot front setback this I should note this district doesn't have isn't kind of similar 
dis or uh, the opposite of our B4 and C5 and other our mixed use districts have maximum building setbacks. The C1 district doesn't have a maximum building setback. So all they have to do is meet the minimum. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. <clears throat> Commissioners, any further questions for staff at this point? Otherwise, uh, Mr. Johnson, is the applicant available tonight to speak to the item? That's correct. I believe the architect, Dave Phillips, is available for questions. All right, Mr. Phillips, would you like to speak to the Planning Commission? I think we hear you. Well, I'm, I'm temporarily unmuted. Can I get unmuted? Here. We can hear you. If you have okay, I have to hold down my space bar to get that. It, it was my screen with the temporarily unmuted. Uh, is there a way that you can unmute me? Mr. Markagar, are you able to help out with that? Um, yeah, how's that, Mr. Phillips? Are you there? Can you hear me now? Yep, we yep. can hear you, Mr. Phillips. There you go. I can't see me, but that's all right. The, uh, 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 thank you for uh, your time. It was a long presentation, Nick, but I appreciate that you did it, and I got out of doing it, so thank you. <laughs> I have a couple of comments and questions. Uh, if you look, uh, Nick, down on the, uh, I don't know if you can see the screen, if you could call up the service shop there. Um, we had a question about indoor trash, and, and I wanted to show you. Uh, uh, I think it will be the first there. There we go. Oh, he's bringing it up now. Yeah, you see, if, if you look on the east side, there is an overhead door into a long room there. That would be our indoor trash and recycling room right there. Right that way. Yeah. Okay. Right I see Mr. Johnson circling it. Yeah. That's it. Um, uh, so, so we uh, we have that. The uh, uh, appreciate the uh, commentary on the stair tower. We agree that the rear exit stair from the uh, parking ramp would be better to be in close, much safer in the winter if we need to use that stair. Um, so, thank you for supporting that. Uh, I have. Uh, just one note on the cable rail. So if, if you go back to the, uh, the to uh, showing the side of the ramp. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this one. Oh, oh, to, uh, oh yeah, stop. Um, I, I just want to know I'm going to say anybody on the elevation um, where we have glass in the ramp here and then an ECM, I call it a crown or fascia above the glass. We wrap the glass 20 feet uh, around the side. If you can see on the very front there on the left side of that, where you say 46, we have 20 feet. So our intent would be to wrap the cable rails 20 feet on the very north end of the east and west right there on the east of, in addition to the front. But, uh, again, those tires are not in and out cars. It's not a parking ramp. It's a car warehouse. Uh, they move rarely, and uh, you really don't get any headlights, nor do they really shine at any residential use uh, there. And, uh, there. So we'd, we'd like to clarify that the cable rails would wrap around, slightly around the two sides on that um you you uh, in that particular order um the uh i, I should uh, agree that there's no other body service proposed at this site um there would be a, an occasional windshield replaced but we do that in the service shop um the, uh, knowing that the car wash um Right now, we would expect to stack cars waiting for car wash along the south wall 
if you can go back to the site plan for a minute. Give me one second. Yeah. Yeah, there. Um, I, I, the plan would be that our car is heading left, waiting for a car rash, we'll turn right into the car rash and exit to the north. That would put the, the noisiest part of the car wash is the uh, pillars to drive the car. And that would put them facing away from the uh, residential. That requires when we do that, we're going to heat that slab in between so it doesn't ice up. We once we turn the car wash and exit to the north, we lose the benefit of the solar energy to melt the uh, ice that comes out with the car as they drip off. So, but but we understand uh, the city's desire to be good neighbors and we will work with you, Nick, and the city engineers uh, and most people to be a good neighbor for for this. So I wanted to uh, say that. With that, I think that's a, uh, uh, we, we, I, I just touch on one last thing and then I'll be done. The, in terms of Sensors Restaurant, Sensors Restaurant was closed. It may have, it, you may have found another user to reopen it, but the pandemic really took the business down with it. So so the any job last there is theoretical. We didn't, we didn't close the restaurant. They were closing either way. The uh, uh, only uh, uh, advantage this plan has is the significant advantage over what I brought you a year ago before the pandemic hit us is we have a slightly larger ramp and the larger on grade parking amount here gives us what we need to add that third floor and corporate office. So the new combined site is why we're able to fully commit to bringing walls or corporate jobs to this location. We like the prestige of having our flagship store with the corporate office in a highly visible location in your city. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, uh, the ramp in one phase instead of two also has a, a substantial um, financial benefit. I, I believe we saved between a million and a half and two million dollars on the project, not splitting that ramp into two builds. We got very good pricing coming out. Uh, the production of the actual ramp uh, pieces is scheduled to start uh, in late June. Uh, and uh, we're very excited for the project. We appreciate working with the city to give the city the assurances uh, that they were looking for. Uh, Walzer's committed to uh, Bloomington and would respectfully request your approval of all our requests here. Thank, thank you. No, I can't hear. Of course I have to go off. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Phillips. I appreciate your comments and uh, your ability to answer some of the questions that were brought up um, to Mr. Johnson during uh, our discussion a little bit earlier. Um, appreciate that very much. Commission members, is there any questions or are there any questions for Mr. Phillips? Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one quick question, uh, Mr. Phillips. One of the comments that we received from the public um, mentioned about uh, traffic at the entrance and exit, and I'm just wondering if uh, in your design you've given any thought to a stop sign at that exit. Uh, for, for this site? Um, yes. We have no, no objection to a stop sign that's really on the city. Uh, uh, Boulevard, um, if, if we're supposed to put it up, I, we, we stop there anyway, so we would not object to putting a stop sign on the exit there. Thank you. 
All right, any further questions from commissioners for Mr. Phillips? Not seeing any, Mr. Phillips, I appreciate your ability to uh, be here tonight to talk to your application. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Mr. Markergaard or, uh, yeah, Mr. Markergaard, is there anybody from the public that would like to speak to this item? Mr. Chairman, uh, nobody has pre-registered, but we'll check in with Mr. Pease, see if there are any callers on the line. Mr. Pease, do we have any callers? At this time, there is no callers online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pease. All right, commission members, seeing that there's nobody from the public to speak to this item at this time, I would entertain a motion to close public hearing. Commissioner Goldsman. So moved. All right, we have a motion to close public hearing. Is there a second? Commissioner Albrecht. Second. All right, thank you. Commission members, we have a motion and a second to close public hearing. Any further discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor of closing the public hearing say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman. Aye. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Cookton. Aye. And I for myself, motion passes. Public hearing is now closed. Commission members, any uh, discussion? Any initial comments? <clears throat> I will, uh, maybe I'll just go ahead and start here a little bit. Uh, clearly we had this application or a similar application about a year ago. Um, we uh, heard a lot of uh, questions, I think, from the public at that point. Uh, I feel like the application in front of us has been proactive in addressing any of the issues that were brought up in the last application. Um, as far as uh, the, uh, again, the, uh, the requests in front of us, I think the uh, plan development proposals are relative or requests are relatively minor. Um, and again, we we did move uh, uh, a year ago that the uh, auto sales facility was appropriate in this location. Now we're uh, being asked to look at the additional space that would be required um, to make this facility and the public benefit and I believe it meets the thresholds. Um, certainly happy to see uh, Walzer reinvesting uh, in the city of Bloomington, and I'm happy at the fact the uh, uh, the proposal and the phasing that's been uh, proposed with the project. So, all right, Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I would fill your statement and then just add that I'm excited to see that their corporate supporters are moving to Bloomington, so uh, prior applications was sales and service staff uh, associated with the Toyota brand and, and dealership, but having a corporate office added to um, the city of Bloomington um, just adds uh, more to this application. So overall, I, I like this application better than the one I approved um, last year, and I'm excited to see those jobs coming to our city. Thank you, Commissioner Goldsman. Uh, Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To my question to Mr. Johnson earlier regarding uh, jobs gained versus jobs lost, I would just like to ask staff that on future applications where we see um, an argument for public benefit that jobs are added, if we could see uh, sort of a net value of jobs lost, if that is the case, recognizing that census was closed and that that's no fault of the applicants in this case, but I think that would be good information for this commission uh, in future cases. Good point, Commissioner Dan. Thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I too will echo Commissioner Cook Dunn's uh, request for that job data. I'd be very curious to know. Um, I'm my guess would be that there would be a, a higher number of jobs. That, versus being uh, the sensor site, but who knows? Um, so just, yeah, out of curiosity, I think that would be great information to have. Uh, uh, regarding the site plan, um, I think this is an improvement from what we saw in 2020. 
uh, moving the parking structure to the east side it makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, and in fact, is moved further away from the condominiums who uh, were worried about the uh, headlights, noise, et cetera. Um, so this, I think they, the, the developer, the architect has taken the um, public testimony into account. And I think this, uh, like Commissioner Goldsman said, is an improvement and uh, I'm in full support. The, the one thing that I do wanna mention is I do also uh, appreciate the narrowing of the in and out off of American Boulevard, um, just regarding pedestrian feel along American Boulevard. There are people who live in this area, and clearly we heard from some of them in the in the letter to walk along American Boulevard. I think a narrower narrower entrance and and exit makes it uh, makes cars slow down, pay more attention, uh, and they're make therefore making the pedestrian experience a lot better. So I do appreciate that and wanted to call that out as well. Um, and that is all that I have. So I'm in support. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, Commissioner Corman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not much left to say. Just uh, want to say thank you for the complete and very detailed application. Uh, very positive, and um, I also wanted to say that I did feel um, do feel appreciation for uh, what seems to be consideration towards um, request of um, the community as well. Um, so, of course, I'm in support. All right, thank you, Commissioner Corman. Uh, Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, echoing all the things that have been said, uh, including the the Java data question. Uh, to the specific things that we're being asked about with deviations, um, the stair tower, um, I don't find that to be a intrusive uh, deviation. Uh, the cable railing on the north, I also don't find that to be a problematic deviation uh, that like, we can never say never, but I don't envision any scenario whereby anything will be built between uh, that uh, rail and the freeway, so I don't think it'll be an intrusion, which is what that standard is meant to prevent. Um, this is a project that I would like to see. Uh, hopefully, this is the last time we see it. It's a little bit of the Groundhog Day of projects uh, with the commission. So, um, hopefully, with the office jobs moving in and new ways of working, that this can get in shovels in the ground sometime this year would be great. Um, and I'm supportive. All right, thank you, Commissioner Roman. There is one piece, and I will. Uh, I want to make sure we discuss as a group here, and that that uh, Mr. Phillips had brought up, and it really relates to condition number one. If this does move forward, condition number one does state the parking parking structure must be designated to block vehicle headlights at minimum height consistent with the Minnesota Building Code on all floors and elevations, except. For the northern elevation and i think mr phillips brought up the fact that that cable would wrap um at least on the west corner so uh, be thinking about that commissioners as uh part of this as this moves forward commissioner Cookdown, you had your hand up um i did but it's unrelated to the cable railing if you want to think that's fine Okay, um, I would actually like to ask Mr. Johnson a question uh, regarding the height variance being requested. Um, just for public benefit, sometimes this commission is very strict on um, allowing increases in height in certain applications. This one with PD flexibility, it seems uh, we're more open to it. Could you just explain uh, for public benefit why in this case we aren't, you know, sometimes we say things like, well, there are there other options than this, or is this the plight of the landowner or things like that? Can you explain why this is different? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chairman Solberg, Commissioner Cookdown, thanks for the opportunity. Um, uh, number one, I think what you're going to evaluate with any variance or request for PD flexibility is the scale or extent of the uh, encroachment or increase. Um, uh, in terms of uh, going beyond what code allows, in this case, we're talking about a two and a half foot uh, encroachment. So, in the scale of a you know 50 foot uh, tall building, 
uh, it's it's very modest in terms of the uh, overall impact of it. Uh, in addition to that, the stair tower itself is a, a very small or a minor portion of the structure. It's not as if they are uh, proposing this height continuously along the full southern elevation. Uh, so those are kind of gets to the ex the kind of extent or the amount of the encroachment uh, side of the analysis. Uh, the other side of the analysis is for what what purpose are we uh, are you granting this deviation beyond uh, what code would allow? And in this case, the applicant and in, uh, in our judgment has made a compelling case that having an enclosed stair tower uh, just as a safer uh, and more uh, comfortable solution uh, for this uh, for this facility than an than an unenclosed stair tower. Uh, so with an enclosed stair tower, you know, you're talking about keeping out the seasonal elements that can make a, a, a stairwell, frankly, in a, a parking structure uh, more dangerous or more apt for accident or injury. Um, so it, it's a it's a user uh, safety and certainly a user preference to keep them out of the elements. But given the, the modest uh, uh, extent of the deviation, as well in combination with the increased safety in our judgment, uh, it's something we uh, felt compelled to support. Anything else on that, Commissioner Kirkton? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, thanks. Um, Mr. Johnson, maybe you could just clear for, clarify for me. Can you explain why we may or may not have more discretion in this case to allow that um, variance as opposed to another case? Because again, sometimes we say, because when I was looking at the plan view of that, I mean, certainly the stair tower, if I'm not mistaken, could have been shifted north and been code compliant. Um, and so why don't we why don't we have the same reasoning of of judgment here that there were other options that could have been code compliant? You're muted, Mr. Johnson. Sorry about that. Uh, that boils down to the basis of you know what type of findings do you have to make uh, for a variance versus a, a PD flexibility. Uh, the threshold or bar that you have to reach for a variance is higher than that of a, a PD flexibility in terms of the practical difficulties test versus public benefit uh, test. Um, and the, the PD specifically states that flexibility can be considered that uh, results in enhanced design. In our opinion, enclosed versus unenclosed is an enhanced design. In terms of moving the stair tower, uh, further to the north, I think that that would likely have uh, some elements of building and fire code review with respect to required uh, separations between um, stairwells to get in and out of the facility. Um, so I don't know if I'm fully qualified to speak to that, but if you move the stair tower, certainly it's going to have other impacts on the the, the site plan. So. Um, could it be done? I'm certainly sure it could. You know, if you wanted a, a, an architect's uh, opinion as to what informed that design, um, certainly Mr. Phillips might be able to speak to that better than I. Um, but again, just given the modest, uh, given the modest extent of the uh, 2.5 feet um, above the maximum height limit, and then the, the modest size of the stair tower itself, as well as uh, you know the the lesser bar or findings that have to be met for PD flexibility. It was just a um, uh, something where it was something that was uh, supported by staff. So hopefully that provides a more uh, fuller explanation. Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to speak to the question about the cable wrap, and I appreciate the applicant being straightforward with that and uh, bringing that up. I don't necessarily know that I find that to be an issue given the intention of how the cars are intended to be parked. Um, my my understanding from what I see in the schematics is that um, you know, they want as many cars facing north as possible. And so my assumption is based on that, that those east-west wraps would not have headlights and so shining on them. And again, these cars are not coming and going multiple times during the day. Uh, and on the west side, they would face the dealership building, and on the east side, they would face the parking lot for the Denny. So um, I don't know if you're thinking that we need some different language on the condition for that, or if um, there's enough independent uh, approval in the planning department to take care of that. But um, to your question, I don't find it to be a major problem per se. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Roman, I, or Commissioner Roman. I appreciate that. And I wanted to make sure that as a commission, 
uh, everybody understood that. And for staff, um, as that would wrap, and I don't know what the distance might be, 10 feet or 12 feet, is that incidental um, to the condition? Or uh, do we need to make changes if uh, this moves forward as a proposal, uh, as approval? Yeah, Chairman Solberg. I mean, my suggestion would be if if the if the Planning Commission is okay with the cable railings as currently being proposed or shown by the applicant, we can certainly uh, revise or amend the condition on a staff level uh, to ensure that it meets that intent. It's condition okay. number condition number twenty one. So twenty one. Yep. So as long as we we clarify that through discussion, um, then you'll know the direction to adjust that uh, ever so slightly. That's my opinion, and unless Glenn wants something more specific on the record. Mr. Markgaard? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, I think it would be good to have the direction from the Planning Commission, and you could even include that in your motion to, to modify the condition to that effect. Okay, thank you, Mr. Markgaard. Commissioner Cookton? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Johnson, could you bring up a plan view? I'm a little concerned about headlights getting onto the hotel here if we um, allow the cable railing to, on the east side. Oops, I'm sorry. Do you have one that shows the hotel? I do. He's pulling that up. I believe the restaurant is in the front of the property and the hotel is in the back. So, so we'd be if I do, this is, this is, uh, forgive me, Chairman, if I had to approximate, it looked like the northern edge of the ramp is right about uh, near where this island terminates, I believe. So you're probably you know, where those headlights would be shining. Um, if the, again, and Walzer's intent, what they've communicated to us now, certainly there might be instances where they, uh, where this doesn't occur, but what they've told us is that the vehicles parked in those areas are more for display and not, uh, um, would not be moved unless specifically requested by a customer, of course. Uh, but I believe on the basis of where I believe the ramp to be, I think the, those headlights would be shining near the termination of that island in the shared access. So it'd be kind of on the northern edge of the hotel, uh, more over the Denny's. Comment, Mr. Chairman, to Steve Phillips. Um, hold on, Mr. Phillips. And um, so, just so I'm clear, uh, Commissioner Cookdown, your concern is if that wrapping would have cars facing to the east. So, Mr. Phillips, can you answer if the cable median would wrap? And a lot to a level on the east side. Uh, that cars would have headlights facing that way. Yeah, we would like the cable rail to wrap 20 feet on the west and 20 feet on the east. The east side really is more, it's north of the hotel, so it's closer to Brennan's uh, if you uh, uh, if you look at the site plan where we have about 125 feet. South, I think a mixed description is correct. I, I, I want to point out that it's the only level that is going in and out is the roof parking. And that does not have any cable rail. That has your headlight protection on all four sides. That's where the employees would park. Um, the, the parking on the second and third levels in the front corners are really stationary cars unless we sell them. If we sell that one particular red Toyota Corona, we would go up and move it, but it, it's storage. So there's no in or out uh, of the front row of parking uh, on there. Um, the glass just protects a little wind as long as we're putting the glass. Uh, we just wanted to wrap it around the corners to, to cut a little wind. But you, you won't see, I, I, I can really uh, assure you that there's just no traffic. It's not a parking ramp, it's a storage. So, yes. Appreciate that, Mr. Phillips, for clarifying the answer for us that it's just the first 20 feet on uh, east and west side and that the upper ramp has the barrier. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. 
All right, Commissioner Cook Dunn, does that uh, help answer part of the question? Because that really is a parking bay. Um, nothing would be facing east or west at that if I see the parking uh, schematic correctly. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I guess I do have concerns about us approving that this evening because uh, there also there, is there a drive aisle there as well that could shine headlights? I'm not really sure. I get a little anxious about this commission sort of designing from the dais, if you will, in just a few minutes here. I guess my preference would be that we have something in our condition that says if staff is okay with it, perhaps we're okay with it, or you know maybe staff looks at this before it gets to council and have, have council take a look at that. I, I'm anxious about just approving that without somebody having a good set of eyes on it. Not that I'm accusing the applicant of ill intent, but I mean, I mean, I am seeing a drive aisle there and I would hate to see um, us incidentally approve headlights going onto that hotel uh, in a short time frame. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Cookton. Other commissioners, comments? Chairman Solberg, if I may, this is Nick Johnson. Just to clarify what I brought up here on my screen, this is the floor plan. And I think thank you, Mr. To what, Johnson. just to show into what uh, I think the architect's intent and what he was attempting to describe is that you can see this is the second uh, floor of the ramp. These are the north facing uh, vehicles, which are you know under display where you can see the cable railing. There's actually a call out note. So the cable railing would terminate um, in that 20 foot dimension or 18 feet here showed on the uh, plan, but um, the, the east west uh, oriented parking spaces have the typical uh, headlight screening. Um, whereas the cable railing stops short here. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but it stops right there. Yes, we can. And there, and then the parking uh, moves along from there. So hopefully that sheds a little more light on it. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I think seeing this, I I don't have a uh, concern as maybe uh, other commissioners might um, that the <clears throat> cable rail is really intended for viewing the parking or the drive aisle. Um, while may have a very limited number or amount of light that shines past the rail, it's not intended to uh, give any headlights in that drivey aisle, uh, uh, anything that can be seen outside the building. So um, I guess those are my thoughts and the fact that this is where cars storage is, it's, it's fairly random that it would be uh, impactful, if at all. Um, but other commissioners, thoughts? Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm being mindful of um, Commissioner Cookton's good advice of us not trying to play architect on the fly. Um, and I'm trying to think of um, Mr. Markergaard said it would be good to have language um, clarifying. So um, I, I'm just wondering if the, if the body is comfortable with um, us talking about that the the wrap is permissible, uh, but not farther than would encroach into a drive aisle or a parking facing the. No parking could face the the cable. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, lo I'm looking for language that would meet the test without having us get into the nitty gritty of making those decisions. And I, I think you, this. Commissioner Roman. I think you you probably just said it. The intent being that uh, cars. Uh, in the drive aisle would be able, headlights would be able to be seen outside the building if, while they're in the drive aisle or something to that attempt. Um, the parking clearly is indicated drawing as being behind the wall. It's really a question of the drive aisle from what I'm seeing. And the question I guess would be then if the, the visuals, the schematics presented here are sufficient or if um, my colleagues feel like we should have something more specific um, to address that. I, I personally am comfortable with the schematics I see, uh, but from a staff perspective, if that's sufficient to uh, enforce on, um, on permits. Okay. Mr. Johnson, maybe you can think about that a little bit. Uh, Commissioner Cookton? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, oh, if you. All right. If you wanted to amend condition number 21, uh, you could add some language at the end. So it currently uh, concludes 
it says on all floors and elevations except for the northern elevation. And you could tack on to that and the northerly 20 feet of the eastern and western elevation. Thank you, Mr. Mark Bird, uh, for our suggestions. Commissioner Cookdown, get some more thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I was wondering if Commissioner Roman or others would be um, amenable to um, a modification of that um, number 21 to include um, something about we approve that upon um, a positive recommendation from staff. That way they have a chance to look at it and see anything that they see and that sort of covers us or is that um, I'll just throw that out there. Yeah, I think you're right. I like that. Okay, so upon engineering review. Something uh, uh, to that nature. All right, uh, other commissioners, I, I, I don't have any problems with that being added on as a uh, to a potential condition, other commissioners, any thoughts or discussion? Otherwise it feels like we're, we're picking on uh, conditions and feels like we're moving towards a, uh, a uh, recommendation and I would be open to a motion. And just to uh, clarify, Mr. Markergaard, that for that condition on 21 um, that we would adjust, is that in this first um, recommendation? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, number three. It would be, yeah, your third recommendation. Thank you. Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, I'm happy to make a motion, Chair. Go ahead. In case PL2021 42, I recommend approval of a comprehensive plan map amendment to re guide 4217 American Boulevard West from community commercial to regional commercial. All right, Commissioner members, we have a motion. Is there a second? Commissioner Goldsman? Second. All right, Commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us to recommend approval of a comprehensive plan amendment. To reguide 4217 Boulevard West from community commercial to regional commercial. Any further discussion on that? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of say aye by roll call, Commissioner Goldsman? Aye. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I, for myself, unanimous, that motion now passes. Moving on, uh, entertain a motion for another. All right, uh, Commissioner Roman, you're beating me to the Thank line. you, Mr. Chair, if I may. In case PL2021-42, I recommend approval of an ordinance rezoning 4217 American Boulevard West, except the southern 150 feet thereof, from CS-0.5 PD to C-1 PD. All right, thank you, Commissioner members. We have a motion in front of us. Is there a second? Commissioner Corman? Second. All right, Commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us to recommend approval of an ordinance rezoning 4217 American Boulevard West, except the southern 150 feet thereof from CS 0.5 PD to C-1 PD. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman? Aye. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I for myself. Motion passes. All right, Commissioner members, moving along, um, look for a um, third motion. This one, again, would have the um, amended condition to number 21. I think Mr. Johnson's trying to bring that up when we get there. So hopefully you have this on your iPads. Commissioner Albrecht. I'm happy to take a stab at it. Uh, 
Oops. Uh, in case PL2021-42, having been able to make the required findings, I move to recommend approval of preliminary and final development plans for a three-story, approximately 122,000 square foot motor vehicle sales and office facility with a three-story parking structure with roof parking subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report with the addition of in, uh, in condition 21 uh, and the northerly, northerly 20 feet of the easterly and westerly elevations as approved by the planning manager. All right, commission members, we have a motion. Uh, is there a second? Commissioner Crypton. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second in front of us. If you can go ahead and put up that uh, language, um, Mr. Johnson, I think that would be helpful for me as I reread this. All right, commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us. Uh, motion being have it to recommend approval of the preliminary and final development plans for a three story, approximately 122,000 square foot motor vehicle sales and office facility with a three story parking structure with roof parking subject to the conditions and code requirement attached code requirements attached to the staff report and the addition of language and the northerly 20 feet of the easterly and westerly elevations as approved by the planning manager to condition number 21. Any further discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman. Aye. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Cookton. Aye. And I for myself. Thank you. That motion passes. Commissioner is looking for the fourth motion uh, to complete this application in front of us. Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In case number PL2021-42, having been able to make the required findings, I move to recommend approval of the preliminary and final plat of PA Walzer second edition subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. All right, thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. All right, commissioners, we have a motion in front of us. Is there a second? Commissioner Roman. Second. All right, commission. Members, we have a motion and a second in front of us. Motion being, having been able to make the required findings, move to recommend approval of the preliminary and final plat of PA Walzer, second edition, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Any further discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman. Aye. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Cookton. Aye. All right. Aye for myself. Motion passes. We'll move to these items. We'll move to the June 17th Planning Commission, with uh, which will be a public hearing. All right. So again, for the public, this will move to the June 17th City Council, and it will be a public hearing. All right. Moving on, Commissioner members, to item number four. Uh, self storage standards, and I believe uh, Mr. James has a staff report for us. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. And I'm hoping you can see the slides and hear me okay. Yes, we can. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started then. So, this item was before you uh, a couple months ago on March 11th. And since then, um, it went to City Council at two different meetings. And so before you tonight is a revised ordinance uh, reflecting council's direction. And then just quick reminder, there is an existing self storage moratorium. It's set to expire um, after one year, which ends June 22nd. So uh, the update then is at the April 5th meeting, council considered the recommendations before them, uh, but they were interested in a, a much more restrictive approach. They wanted staff to return with analysis about options um, such as you know, an outright prohibition on self-storage throughout the whole city, 
um, or ideas around what a, a limit per capita would look like. And so after that April 5th meeting, um, staff also met and brainstormed you know, a few other options to bring to them uh, at the May 3rd meeting. Uh, so at this May 3rd meeting then, council considered you know, the, the, all the options and ultimately recommended a couple additions to the ordinance that planning commission saw a couple months ago. So council's direction included those initial um, recommended standards. Uh, I'll, I'll provide more detail in a minute, but those were the four proposed areas to prohibit self-storage uh, that were presented at the last meeting. Uh, council also recommended an additional prohibition in the whole Lindale study area. And then also that council approved this uh, conditional use permit that's required of self-storage facilities. So just quick background here, you recall staff put together a study um, last year, identifying key issues that included you know, having, having a disproportionate supply of self-storage in the city compared to our neighbors. Um, the use does generate lower commercial activity and employment activity is low in these larger buildings. Uh, and the height and lighting of these newer facilities really impacts adjacent residential. And blue is where we allow um, self-storage today if there was no moratorium. And then we have uh, nine self-storage facilities. Those are the yellow dots on the screen. And again, conditional use permits required for all facilities. So um, a little bit more background. This was the initial recommendation that was before you uh, at the last meeting. Um, the baseline then was to prohibit in transit station areas. So it's a half mile area around transit stations, uh, prohibit in areas designated as protected industrial by the comprehensive plan. And then uh, a structure setback for storage facilities that are within 500 feet of residential, or rather a, a facility the building could not be within 500 feet of residential properties. And then also a prohibition on parcels adjacent to Lindale Avenue. So at the last meeting, Planning Commission recommended a couple uh, modifications to this. One was to reduce that distance from residential to 250 feet, and then to allow, um, or rather to prohibit uh, self-storage only in the 86th Street and 98th Street nodes to allow elsewhere on Lindale, but with you know, more design standards. So that opened up a few areas uh, where potential facilities could, could go. However, council did want to see a more restrictive, restrictive approach. They opted for these um, initial recommendations as a baseline. Um, but they also preferred to prohibit in all of the um, parcels in that Lindale study area. So that's highlighted in the hatched area on the screen here. Uh, in this area, council was especially concerned about future impacts of um, self-storage in the event that this area sees more residential or commercial activities. Um, so adding this prohibition to this Lindale Avenue area, it doesn't create any uh, additional non-conforming facilities from those other baseline recommendations, um, but it does add quite a few parcels that simply would not allow self-storage. And I circled in yellow um, those areas that um, allowed self-storage with the baseline recommendation, but with this direction would prohibit self-storage. So then if we only look at you know, the parcels or portions of parcels um, remaining after all the prohibitions, we're left with those blue areas on the screen. Um, there's a couple sites north of 494 to the west uh, that would be viable, large enough sites. Um, 
There's uh, somewhat of a site north of Civic Plaza. However, a portion of that is the public works building today. And then we've got a few sites up along American Boulevard, just west of Nicolette Avenue. Um, however, a couple of those are already self-storage facilities. So the ordinance also includes council approval of the um, CUP. This doesn't affect the current operation of self-storage facilities. They all have um, CUPs, but it does add two to three weeks to the review process for any new or, or revised uh, conditional use permits. And here's a comparison of the different approaches then, uh, initial and then planning commissions and councils. Uh, the proposed ordinance, which reflects council's approach here, um, would still create non or seven non-conforming facilities. Um, however, a lot fewer of those candidate sites would be available. Uh, in those candidate sites, there were staff's kind of best estimate of sites that could accommodate self-storage under the given uh, recommendations. Uh, but they don't take into account existing uses and vacancies in any way. And then here's a comparison of the different um, standards that have been considered then. Uh, so there's general agreements on prohibiting in protected industrial areas and in transit station areas, but their recommendations have varied um, based on the distance from residential and then how a prohibition in the Lindau area should apply. So um, since that last um, March and April meetings with council, staff did send one additional letter to property owners to update them on the um, status and process thus far. Um, we've received a couple items of correspondence. We've also you know, provided meeting notice um, through the methods shown here. Um, but those couple items of correspondence, one was, um, in response to the letter staff mailed it's from a storage facility and they were opposed to a more restrictive approach. Now they might be interested in um, rebuilding or renovating their facility in the coming years. And then another letter from a resident um, and that was sent right before that last council meeting. Um, and that resident was in support of a prohibition on all of self storage, but you know, certainly if not a prohibition, uh, a more restrictive approach. So staff does have a recommended a motion then um, to approve the ordinance uh, before you that reflects council's uh, direction. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. James. Um, any questions from commission members for Mr. James? Not seeing any for you at this time, Mr. James. I think we can, as a city, as the applicant, we will go, Mr. Markegaard. Is there anybody um, from the public that would like to uh, address this issue? Mr. Chair, nobody has pre registered to speak, but we'll check in with Mr. Pease. Mr. Pease, do you have anybody on the line? Uh, there's no callers at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pease. All right, so commission members, um, well, with public hearing open at this time and not seeing any buddy from the public that would wish, wish to speak to this item, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Commissioner Goldsman. So moved. All right, thank you, commission members. We have a motion to close public hearing. Is there a second? Commissioner Roman. Second. All right, commission members, we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman? Aye. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Sorry, Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I for myself, the public hearing is now closed. 
Okay, Commission members, this seems to be a recurring event for us to go back and forth uh, with the City Council on various uh, proposals. Um, interested that there weren't uh, maybe more people from the public uh, commenting on this, but um, we clearly had a different direction than the City Council um, on the initial uh, review. I think the city council again has now looked at it and made it maybe even stronger the opposite direction of us of our recommendation so discussion commissioner goldsman thanks mr chair so i think i was the lone nay on the last vote um my sticking point was the lindale avenue uh retrofit really we had just approved that retrofit and the design and and vision and I really struggled with um, with approving the the proposal at hand due to that uh, piece. Um, so I'm actually in support of the city council's recommendations of preventing or restricting it to the Lindale Avenue um, corridor. Um, I think that's a prudent thing to do, especially as it's being redeveloped over over the years. Um, Moving over to the distance from residential, I think we said 250 versus 500 feet. Um, I, I'm okay with the 250 as long as we're being cognizant of the lighting and the traffic flow in front of um, the residents. So that's an area that I was uh, somewhat disappointed about the change, um, but I guess it wouldn't be a sticking point for me. Um, just the last thing is, when you look at the map of the allowed locations, it's somewhat comical to say that we allow um, self storage in the city of Bloomington um, because it it really is a moratorium without saying it's a moratorium. There there really are very few uh, properties that could be compliant, and and as staff mentioned. Um, some of those properties are city owned, uh, so very unlikely that they'd actually be um, developed. So there's a lot of things in here that I'm just not in love with, um, but you know, the Lindale Avenue piece is something that I'm glad to see and um, I'll take the rest of my comments and listen to see what everyone else has to say. All right, thank you, Commissioner Goldsman. I think you were the uh, the lone wolf on that last vote, but uh, we we certainly don't hold that against you. <laughs> Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think, uh, you know, I will start by saying clearly the council has expressed their desire and their preference as the decision makers in our city. This is their prerogative to do so. Um, I, I What echoes for me is what Commissioner Goldsman said about, you know, if you look at this map, why don't we stop playing games and just pass an ordinance that says no new self storage in Bloomington period and move on. Um, so, um, again, the council, this is what the council would like to see. This is what I believe the council will pass. I do not intend to vote in favor of it. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Roman. Other uh, commissioners, other commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, I echo Commissioner Roman and Commissioner Goldsman's <clears throat> comments. I think I said this from the very get-go that when we originally were having this conversation, we are just extending the moratorium. That is what we're doing. And if that is the prerogative, like Commissioner Roman mentioned at the city council, and that's the direction in which they want to go, then great, let's do it. Um, but I don't see a reason why we have to say, not here, not here, not here. Oh, and this parcel right here, that's okay. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Commissioner Goldsman. This is a comical map. Um, this doesn't make any sense it, to me. I think it's either we figure out how we can allow it and allow the market, which obviously um, can absorb these units, um, absorb this use, and we allow it and we figure out how to allow it. Um, or we don't allow it, but I don't think this in between approach is uh, is smart. And I uh, I'm going to vote um, against this one. All right, thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. <clears throat> Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also am not in favor of this. And 
echoing what other commissioners have said, it looks a little ridiculous uh, what we're doing here. And it, it just sort of really surprises me that in a city with quite literally thousands of parcels, we can only find four that are allowed to have self storage that something's not right about that. And touching on Lindale Avenue, because I know that's the biggest sticking point for me, the contention has always been that uh, there's so much of Lindell that needs to be redeveloped. It's, you know, it's, it's a long street past 98th street and there's so much room there. And if we did start filling it up and we got anxious about it 10 years from now, then we could install a restriction there. But I think in, in 2021, we're, I just don't see us in a position to say, whoa, not, not yet, not, not here. I, it just doesn't make sense to me and that there's so much of Lindale that could stand to be redeveloped. Um, this is this is council's wish. They are the elected of officials and leaders of the city. They may do as they wish, but I will be voting against this application tonight. Thank you, Commissioner. Then Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just meant to mention in my original comments, thank you to the staff for chasing this back and forth. Um, my opinion of this uh, work product is not a reflection of my opinion of your work. Um, I know you're going to chase this back and forth. Um, and so uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Commissioner Roman. Uh, I would agree with you as well. I, I, anybody uh, on this planning commission knows how hard this planning staff works, especially when we challenge them uh, between the city council and the planning commission. So thank you, staff for your work on this. Commissioner Elbrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. Thank you to the planning staff. I, this summary comparison chart where it shows exactly what staff, planning commission, city council, I went straight here. I was looking at, okay, let's, I got to see side by side. This is very helpful. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> the only thing I want to add is Commissioner Cook Dunn said something that, um, you know, we're down to four sites, but not only are we down to four sites, but we have to then get a conditional use permit approved by the city. It's just like another hoop to jump through. Um, and I just, it's, it, I will echo by saying we are pretty much just continuing the moratorium. Um, and so that's what I want to add. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. I, I think the commission definitely. Um, I'm in agreement with most of the commission. <laughs> um, what I would say is to the point that, uh, number one, maybe to the, uh, your last point, Commissioner Albrecht is to add the additional piece of city council approval on something that is so narrowly focused, seems like, um, maybe, uh, more oversight than is needed at the city council for storage facilities. Uh, I still think if, uh, and agree with everybody else that if you want a moratorium, make a moratorium. However, if you want to allow them, but you are concerned with elements of the way they are presented in our community, uh, we can do design standards um, and conditions that would allow them to adapt to our uh, changing community. Um, it, 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 it takes a little more work for each of us and a little more thought process to go through that. Um, but it, it is possible. Uh, that being said, like everybody else, the city council, uh, makes the decision on this and I appreciate, uh, that, uh, but I would be voting against this as well. All right. That being said, any other uh, uh, from my side, any other discussion from council or from commission members? All right, Commissioner Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One more thing. Um, you know, I drive up and down Lindale every day, well, typically every day to go to work and have been driving up and down Lindale and watching the progress of the U-Haul site in which we made some design changes specifically, uh, you know, as a commission recommended um, and, and made it as a, a condition to for approval, um, some design elements. And, I, and, and frankly, I, I can tell, I can tell the difference. I can tell the feel, I can tell the, the difference in walkability in front of that building, around that building. 
So we're not seeing a lot of people walk up and down Lindell in that area right now. You can tell the difference. And I think um, there is, like uh, Chair Solberg said, there is another way. Um, and I think the design standards is is that way. Uh, and so I would encourage the, the city council to really uh, think about that as, as a tool. Um, you know, we do that in, in all different types of ways in our city, including <laughs> including brick facade. So uh, we did it tonight. So I think there are ways that we can make this um, more appealing to folks who would be interested in developing uh, self storage, but also uh, more appealing and creating a more walkable, pedestrian friendly, bike friendly community that we're looking to create. Thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, good comments as always. Commissioner Crookton. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make one last just request to City Council and just ask if do we have to restrict Lindale now or? Can we wait until it starts filling up? I, I appreciate the intent of restricting Lindale. We have a big vision for that plan, which I support very strongly. But staff has told us we could be waiting 25 years or more for that to sort of fill out. And I don't think it's appropriate in 2021 to restrict it now. You know, I support the 86th, the 98th nodes. That's important. That's where we think it's going to start. But to say, 92nd Street is is inappropriate. I, I don't agree with that. And I would just ask the council to consider, you know, we could still do this in the future. We could we can restrict Lindale when we are starting to see that vision come before us, but I think it's too early. And I would just uh ask the council to to consider maybe we we hold off on that Lindale restriction until a later date. All right, thank you, Commissioner Crookton. Uh, let's see. Oh, your hands up again. If there's no further comment, I'm happy to make the motion, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Crookdown. Commission members, any further comments? Not seeing any, Commissioner Crookdown, the floor is yours. Let me uh, hack my way through this here. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, in case PL 2021-20, I move to recommend denial of the ordinance attached to the staff report amending chapter 21 of the city code to establish additional standards for self storage facilities and to remove the moratorium on self storage facilities. All right, thank you, Commissioner Kirkton. We, Commission members, we have a motion in front of us. Is there a second, Commissioner Albrecht? Second. All right, Commission members, we have a motion in front of us and a second to recommend denial of the ordinance attached to the staff report amending chapters 21 of the city code to establish additional standards for self storage facilities and to remove moratorium on self storage facilities. Any further discussion on this item? Commissioner Crookton? Mr. Chair, I just want to be clear about my, emo my emotion here as I'm trying to read this on the fly. I'm uh, uh, recommending denial of the entire package here. Yes, that is correct. That is what I understand. All right, commission members, uh, any further discussion? Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So to be clear in that denial, the moratorium stays. As a recommendation, that would be the case. Thank you. All right, commission members, any further discussion? Commissioner Cookman. Uh, I just wanna have clarification on the moratorium. I guess I would be, um, because well, aren't there limits on a moratorium that it would automatically expire after 12 months or how does that work? Uh, let's see. Let's get a, a helpline from staff on that one. Yep. So, Mr. Chair, that's set to expire on June 22nd. Okay. Hey, Commissioner Crookdown, did you hear that? I did, and I would not have any issue with that moratorium expiring. All right, uh, commission members, any further discussion? Seeing all those in favor of the motion to recommend denial of the ordinance attached to the staff report amending chapter 21 of the city code say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman. Aye. Commissioner Corman. 
want to make clear once again, so I don't get confused as last time. This is denial of, and this includes the whole package, correct? Correct. Okay, aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Cookton. Aye. And I for myself, uh, the motion has been recommended for denial to the city council. Um, as I understand, this item will go to city council on May 24th, and it is a public hearing. So again, for folks in the public that would be interested, May 24th at the city council, and it is a public hearing. All right. Thank you, commission members, for uh, your work on that item. Moving on to item number five, which is uh, proposed school crosswalk safety improvements um the vicinity of france and 108th and amy marone has the staff report for us Ms. marone sorry about that i uh had to click back out of a few things to be able to unmute myself so let me reach here of this <laughs> Well, at least you unmuted yourself before. Yeah, exactly, before I got too far. All right, good evening, Planning Commission. Um, back in January, we came to you with uh, three proposed spot safety improvements that we had identified as locations that we recommended for implementing with the 2021 PMP projects. And tonight I'm bringing back one additional recommendation for improvement for your consideration. Um, this, the location is on France Avenue at um, just south of Old Shakopee Road, and it is for a pedestrian crossing enhancement um, for the school crossing at that location, along with some associated uh, striping changes that would need to take place to go along with it on France Avenue. There we go. So, um, this is a, a photo from prior to, well, I think it's from 2019, and it is facing south on France Avenue, um, looking at 108th Street and to the south of that. And this location came up when we started having our public open houses um, for the reconstruct, reconstruct reconstruction project that will take place on 108th Street this year. Um, it, one thing that was brought up to us was some concerns with this pedestrian crossing location for the students crossing in this area. Um, and of note is that we had also begun some conversations with representative of the school district as well as the building principal for Westwood Elementary School um, back in late fall of 2019. And um, lastly, we had received a, a contact recently through some um, community engagement outreach staff that work closely with a BIPOC leadership group that um, have residents that are living in the new apartment buildings at 108 Place, just to the west of here. So this um, crosswalk location has, you know, over the last year and a half, so mostly during um, COVID conditions, um, quickly come on our radar is a, a location with a school crossing safety concerns. So what we heard is that people are concerned that the students have to cross at this uncontrolled um, leg of uh, France Avenue, um, that the students have to cross four lanes of traffic. So we've got that multiple vehicle threat. And so I included a graphic here in the bottom that, sh that just briefly to help explain what that multi-vehicle threat is. It's, it's essentially, even if a vehicle stops in the outside lane for a pedestrian that would be crossing the roadway, there's a there's a big area um, where uh, an additional driver headed in that same direction can't see what that driver, what that first curbside driver is stopped for. And so um, when we have a four lane undivided roadway, this is a, a, a big safety concern for pedestrian crossings. Um, see we had also heard from the school district some concerns over um, drivers who are headed southbound to eastbound so making a, the left turn onto 108th street and the large number of pedestrians that are crossing that um, e eastern leg of 108th street as well 
Um, and so we, we, we're looking at some ways to improve that area. Um, typically, one of our first steps would be to get uh, pedestrian counts. And given the COVID um, pandemic, you know, and the effects that that's had on traffic, as well as um, school being in session, out of session, um, we have not been able to collect uh, pedestrian count data, but what we have done is worked with the school district um, and they have identified that there are current, currently there are 30 students that live um, within the Westwood elementary school walking boundary that live west of France Avenue. So those are um, some potential users and we we've heard from other residents in the area that there is pedestrian crossing demand to get uh, to the commercial area just a little bit north and west of this area as well. Uh, France Avenue north of Old Shakopee Road is a county road, but the section south of Old Shakopee is a local Bloomington roadway. Um, the traffic volumes just a little bit north of this picture um, by the commercial and the apartment building driveways are about 6,600 vehicles per day. When you get to this section uh, from 108th Street down to 110th Street, the volumes drop to 3,900 vehicles per day. And then south of 110th Street, we've already done a roadway striping conversion and gone to one lane in each direction, as well as on um, both legs of 110th Street. Um, but the volumes down in that area are closer to 1,100 vehicles per day, just to kind of give a little context of the traffic volume data in that area. So when we first had our conversations with the school district, um, we made some kind of uh, near term or immediate improvements to this area. And we, so now this graphic is facing north on France at the same pedestrian crossing. And you can see it looks a little different than the first image. Um, we ground out the crosswalk markings on the south leg of the intersection. So what we're trying to do is uh, concentrate where the pedestrian crossing movements are happening. And so we wanted to connect, um, re really reinforce um, that the pedestrian crossing movement should happen at the location where we have the ADA um, pad ramps and the better um, pedestrian sidewalk con connectivity. And so cross it, concentrating the the east-west crossings on the north leg. And then we also marked the crossing uh, across the east leg, where we also have the large number of um, students that are crossing in that area. Um, the goal of that is mostly to provide um, guidance to pedestrians on where where it is the best location for them to cross, but also to help just improve awareness for the drivers with the updated signage and pavement markings. Um, another thing we did is we relocated the overhead lighting. So one, one big improvement that we can make that is relatively simple improvement is by um, making sure that we have overhead street lighting as close to the crosswalks as possible. I'm gonna flip back to the old graphic. You can see that the intersection lighting previously was on the south southwest corner. So we worked with Excel and relocated the light pole to the northwest corner and added um, and had them reorient one of the light heads to be over the, the east leg of the crosswalk and added another light head to extend out over the north leg of the crosswalk. So those were the, the near term improvements that we could make. Um, Another element of this project is that this, there's currently a sidewalk gap between the new 108 Place Apartments and France Avenue. And the reconstruction project, the roadway re reconstruction project that's going to happen on 108th Street between Goodrich and Johnson will also include the construction of the sidewalk. So we're getting rid of our sidewalk gaps for continuity to the school, but we are still left with a crosswalk location that is um, students crossing a four-legged undivided roadway. So I added a couple graphics in here just to show that there are there's a lot of research about ways to improve safety at pedestrian crossings. And, you know, we try to stay up on the latest the best treatments. Um, we don't want to over treat a location, but really when we're looking at a crosswalk location, it's not so much a function of the number of pedestrians that are crossing as it is of the situation of the roadway. So we're always gonna be looking at the traffic volumes. We're always gonna be looking at um, 
the number of lanes and the vehicle speeds. Those are the three main characteristics that really drive um, what we should be considering for enhancements for improving the safety of a pedestrian crossing. There are a lot of other um, details that we get into, such as the, the grades of the roadway and looking at the drainage and, and making sure that specific elements will work. But um, those are those are kind of the main drivers. And so here's an example of the latest local road research board um, guidance. It was published in May of 2020. Um, one of the recommendations that they have. Well, here's just an example of we, we currently have four lanes on this roadway. Um, and one thing that they always say is to, you know, look at a striping conversion. If your traffic volumes are lower and you don't, don't need those four lanes of vehicle traffic to accommodate the traffic volumes, that's one of your best ways to make a pedestrian safety improvement. And then when we look um, at our traffic volumes, as I mentioned, we are below 5,000 on this section. Um, you know, we are well under the 9,000 vehicle per day. And so we can accommodate with um, two vehicle lanes would be adequate to to meet the needs of the traffic volumes in this location and then some of the crosswalk enhancements that they can that they suggest in addition to the lighting and the pavement markings and the signage is to consider a raised crosswalk pedestrian refuge island um, some in crosswalk signage or curb extensions and curb extensions are what we think is going to be um, the, the best treatment at this location there's just another one that really gets you to the same results. Um, this is the latest um, MnDOT publication on the best practices for pedestrian and bicycle safety from January of 2021. Um, again, if we get we look at the function of the vehicle speeds and the traffic volumes and the lane configuration. Um, Item number five is curb extension. So yet another recommendation for curb extensions in a, in a very similar situation to what we have. So what curb extensions can do is increase the visibility of the pedestrians crossing the street. So you're moving them closer to closer out into the roadway before they even step into the roadway. So they're in the line of vision for the drivers. Um, it encourages slower turning speeds at the intersection. So by um, you know, just the, the radius and the design of the them, as well as the fact that we are reducing the number of lanes will um, encourage slower vehicle speed or driver speeds through the, through the intersection. Um, it reduces the crossing distance. So that's kind of the amount of time that vehicle or that pedestrians are exposed to vehicles in the roadway. Um, reducing that crossing distance is really critical to that improvement. Can also they can also be used to create essentially a gateway or a visual clue to drivers that they're um, transitioning from uh, the commercial area into a more of a residential area. Um, crash modification factors that can be applied for this specific type of treatment. Um, the research shows that um, there's a can be a reduction of up to 45% of pedestrian crashes. So that's just a measure that we use um, to to compare different improvement options. All right, so what we're proposing is curb bump outs on the north side. And this is uh, just kind of a photo visual visualization of what that improvement would look like. Um, I already talked about the benefits of that a little bit, um, but essentially you're getting improving the visibility of the pedestrians, shortening their crossing distance and providing guide better guidance even to the drivers for expectation of encountering pedestrians. Um, one more thing that I wanted to point out is um, this at this intersection, we are planning to do an always stop um, warrant study after the construction is completed in this area and when um, when we hope traffic volumes will normalize a little bit more. So we're looking at doing completing that data collection and analysis in fall of 2020 or spring of 2022. Um, if the warrants or kind of the, the rules for an always stop are met, we would proceed with installing an always stop control at this intersection, which would provide even additional um, pedestrian safety benefits. Um, so to be able to make this, this to construct this curb bump out, we would be also 
doing this in conjunction with some striping modifications on France Avenue. And as I mentioned, um, when you're up by the commercial driveways, you know, we've got a lot more vehicle lanes, but we have tra higher traffic volumes there. And then the volumes um, drop off significantly after the apartment and commercial, main commercial driveway access. And so not to really get into the exact details of the taper length of this merge and, and stuff, but I really do want to, to show that that this does come, this recommendation would come along with recommending um, striping modifications on France Avenue. Um, here's a little bit closer detail of what that striping merge would look like to go from two lanes southbound to one lane southbound. Um, we would have 16 foot lanes, 16 feet of lane width in each direction, even at the curb bump outs. Um, that would be wide enough for a standard 12 foot lane plus room for um, bicycles if they were still, you know, using the shoulder area to continue through without entering into the, the through lane of traffic. Um, this is a graphic intended to show what the lane widths would be um, south of 108th Street. So we'd have 14 foot through lane in each direction and an eight foot shoulder. Um, and then when we get all the way down to 110th Street, we drop back into um, the existing striping configuration right at that location. Currently has these 11 foot lanes um, to create a right turn lane for traffic turning right onto 110th Street, and then the through lane and the shoulder lane. All right, so uh, for public engagement for, for this effort, um, it has begun somewhat recently since, as I mentioned, this was um, an, an issue that came up and that's something that we identified that we could potentially include with the reconstruction project this year. Um, we moved forward with uh, developing a Let's Talk Bloomington page that has a lot of the um, background information, these graphics and the proposed layout, as well as a resident survey. And so we did a direct mailing to approximately 700 addresses in this area, which we identified as the affected area for both the crosswalk and the striping. Um, it's essentially from Xerxes to Oxborough and Old Shockby Road down to 110th Street. And in that mailing, we included um, how to get to the public engagement on Let's Talk Bloomington, as well as information about tonight's Planning Commission meeting and the upcoming City Council um, meeting for this as well. Um, I also reached out directly to the other um, residents and um, school district staff and other partners that um, had brought this up as a area of concern to get their feedback as well. So on the Let's Talk Bloomington page, it looks as though we've had uh, 39 vis visits to this page over the last few weeks, um, 33. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, as we use this new tool, but we get some very interesting reporting. Um, 33 residents are considered to be um, aware of this project. That means they have uh, registered and visited this page, at least one of the pages on the site. Um, 14 are informed, which means that they've visited multiple pages, um, contributed possibly through the survey or downloaded documents. And then five have um, are engaged and have completed the survey so far. Um, the survey questions, uh, tried to uh, um, ask uh, where people or how, what is their connection to this area? Um, four of the five respondents said that they live in the area. So far, none of them have checked that they have um, students that attend Westwood, which is one specific question that I had, had asked on that. Um, the next question was, do you support the proposed uh, school crossing or pedestrian crosswalk improvement? Um, three indicated that they were uh, generally supportive. One indicated that they were not supportive and I, I can get a little bit more into the, the comments that they left. And then the other one was, um, one was listed as other. And I believe that's because they chose to skip that question. Um, uh, similar to, do you support the proposed striping changes on France Avenue? Had three indicating yes, one indicating no, and one as an other. And then I provided a space for people to identify any other traffic and multimodal safety concerns that they have for this area. Um, and the, the, the resident who indicated no, they were not in support, are, 
their concern is that they believe that the bump outs would cause more congestion and not make it safer for pedestrians. Um, that drivers should obey the traffic laws that are already in place and that these changes wouldn't be needed. And that an all way stop without uh, the curb bump outs would be a better solution. Um, other comments indicated that they were in support of the proposed changes, um, that they would like to see a better bike connection from south of 108th Street up to the uh, new uh, off-road bike trail that runs along the west side of France Avenue. Um, one is a question about why not doing a treatment um, like is on France at Canterbury, and I can address that a little bit separately. And the last comment was to um, ensure that we're providing space uh, for bikes to continue on France without having to enter the drive lane at that curb extension. Um, in response to the question about why we're not proposing an RRFB enhancement like at France and Canterbury, um, I apologize, I should have included a graphic of what that references, but that is essentially a mast arm mounted RRFB, which is a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. Um, and so it's on France Avenue where the traffic volumes are about three times higher at that location than they are at this location. Um, and that we did not have the option to reduce the number of travel lanes in that location to make an initial improvement. And so our key goal at that location was to make sure that um, in addition to providing that pedestrian enhanced um, flashing beacon that we were getting that um, message up and over the roadway so that drivers um, would see that and to try to reduce that multi multi vehicle threat that we talked about earlier. Um, it's a very expensive treatment and we think that we can get um, a very good safety improvement at this location with these lower traffic volumes with this um, with this treatment that we're proposing. Not to say that I, um, I I always am in support of an RRFB treatment at the appropriate location. I just don't think that this is uh, the location for that. All right. So now um, you know I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Amy. Um, appreciate the report on this. And um, I, I, I do have a couple questions. First, I want to thank you, though, uh, for looking at this uh, really as an improvement. I drive this road every day. Well, used to drive it every day um, and often do see kids uh, crossing this location when I would leave in the morning at various times. So um, appreciate you taking a look at this. And I know The, um, the, the development from neighbors about the ability to cross roads. Um, I know you said your your best practice um, that you read through or have through through MnDOT um, about curb bump outs, but I'm also uh, aware that they talk about if you have crosswalks and two legs of an intersection, you should probably put them at all four. So I wonder if you can maybe uh, explain explain some logic uh, and uh, for that. And then also that really goes to ADA um, and preventing or uh, facilitating that at intersections. Um, so, but I understand this is part of the 108th Street reconstruction. Is that correct? Chair Solberg, that is okay. correct. So, and, be, yeah. And, and so then you are making improvements on the south side. They're just not showing. Otherwise, the striping, I like it. Uh, glad to see uh, the reduction in lanes there. Um, but if you could just highlight some of those issues with the bump out and the, the curb ramp and striping, that would help me. Chair Solberg, those are great comments. Um, so. I do want to clarify the reconstruction, the 108th Street reconstruction is for the leg um, to the west of here. So it's not um, the east leg of this intersection. Um, and it, that is a, it's a very good point that the curb ball boats do work well when they're, um, when they would wrap around to, <laughs> and include, uh, encompass the crosswalks on both legs of the intersection. Um, 
we have less concern with the traffic volumes on 108th Street. Um, and so we're not necessarily looking to make um, to reduce that crossing distance. Um, one thing that I'm still working on is um, uh, doing a turning movement count, just like our final check would be uh, doing a, a, sorry, a turning movement check with the school buses. So we don't want to restrict the mobility of the school buses leaving Westwood Elementary. So that one thing in our design is we're trying to make sure that we're not constricting that at all. Um, when you end up with the the bulb out um, wrapping all the way around and you know coming out that that full six to eight feet on both legs that that can provide a little bit more limitations to the school buses. Um, and you had also some questions about signing and striping and I think I missed that. I think I'm frozen up there if you, you can go. hear me. Now I can. I, I just froze up again. I apologize. I'm having internet issues right now. Um, I, I got everything up to maybe the, the if you had a last point that was summarizing it. I may have missed that. Um, Chair Solberg, did you have questions about the striping and the signage as well, or did I address that? It... it yeah, I the one question I had was really, I hope this stays, uh, best practice, uh, my understanding is if you stripe two legs of an intersection, you should stripe four legs. Just um, wondering why that's different um, in this location. Um, Chair Solberg, that, that's, a, that's a good question as well. So one of the things that we've run into is um, on some of our our side street stopped only intersections. If we have all four legs marked with crosswalks, it gives the illusion to the drivers on the stop controlled legs that it's an always stop controlled intersection. So we've actually moved away from that and we have um, tried to prioritize and mark the two legs where we're guiding pedestrians to cross at to try to uh, reduce that uh, confusion to the drivers. Um, it, and so that they don't make that assumption that it isn't always stop control if it's not. So you will often see that we will mark all four legs on an always stop control, but not on a side street stop control. Thank you. No further questions. Uh, Commissioner Roman. I believe Commissioner Cookton was first. Go ahead, Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Roman. Uh, Ms. Barone, <clears throat> forgive me if you don't know the answer to this. Um, I did not grow up in Bloomington. I grew up in a small town where when I left school, there was a crossing guard at the crosswalk. Is that commonplace here in Bloomington? Do you know that? Um, Commissioner Cookton, I, I do know how they operate that in the school district. And so they don't use crossing guards in Bloomington. However, there are um, student patrols at the elementary schools, um, they would not position a student crossing patrol at this location because it is not adjacent to the school property. And so it is um, outside of their purview of where they, they feel that it is safe to be placing students to assist in crossing. Um, but crossing guards is a little bit different. That's um, when you have um, hired, staffed, and they're trained by um, um, I think I'm missing the wording, but they, they are trained by, I believe, the highway department. And um, so they, that is not something that is used in Bloomington. It hasn't been since I've started working here. And it, um, based on discussions, it doesn't seem like something that they are moving towards. Thank you for that information. Okay. Uh, was Commissioner Roman, were you next or were, or is Commissioner Goldsman? I'm happy. To, I think I All was right, next, but ahead. either way. Um, Ms. Maroon, just one question. Um, south of 108th to 110th, uh, your sketches showed that we were returning um, southbound to two lanes, with the, which uh, terminates in a turn lane at 110th. Um, 
the reason why we wouldn't just stripe that to the um, 16 foot with the eight foot shoulder on both sides? Um, Commissioner Roman, do you mean rather than developing that right turn lane down? Right, it looked more like we were re returning to existing condition southbound, which was two lanes. And it's just given that it's a narrow lane to start with because we are trying to squeeze two in there. I just was wondering about the, the thought process on that and if it might just be easier or more logical to, given also the comments about bikes, uh, to continue that from that in that two block stretch with um, the treatment with one lane with the eight foot shoulder. Um, Commissioner Roman, that, that's a good comment. So, you know, our intent is that it will be for the full duration, except for the last um, 100 feet as you're approaching 110th Street, that it would be that two lane um, configuration. Um, it's a good comment though, and we'll take a look and see if there is enough turning traffic where we think that uh, right turn lane, you know, opening up the right turn lane is really needed there, or if it would still just be adequately served by maintaining that single lane all the way to the intersection. Sure, I think that'd be worth a little study. Thank yep. you. Um, Commissioner Solberg tells me he's lost his internet again, so I'll uh, call in Commissioner Goldsman. Thanks, interim chair. Um, I just had a couple of comments based on what I'm seeing here, and um, I am all for anything that ensures safety of residents and and especially kids as you know, kids are walking to school and hopefully um, doing so safely. And I, I commend you for looking at what can be done short term and, and quite easily. So you mentioned, you know, moving the, the light poles, I think. It's nice to see those simple things that can make a big difference, especially as our uh, nights seem to get longer and more of the year in the winter time. So light lighting, I, I commend you for thinking of that because it's it's something that easily can be done, make a huge impact, um, and obviously signage. And then um, you mentioned when this when the street is being redeveloped, you're going to continue the sidewalk. And I know Commissioner Roman is uh, a big advocate of, of having uh, sidewalks and continuation of the sidewalks um, is, is big on his um, agenda. And I, I agree that this is a good improvement, especially with that new uh, apartment complex being uh, recently completed. So all in, I think it's, it's a good solution. And, and I commend you too for looking at best practices and incorporating some of those best practices into the city. It, it will be a change and sometimes people have a hard time with change, but uh, if it makes it safer uh, for everyone, I'm all for it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Goldsman. Um, Commissioner Corman, glad to see you have some thoughts on this one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Moran. Uh, this is, it's really good to see this type of, uh, of plan coming um, as being familiar with um, school related situations around the buildings. I know how important it is to make sure that our, that our, there are systems put in place so that our students are always safe. Uh, one of my biggest concerns is always winter time because it's the when it gets so crazy. And of course, when there's ice or there's big amount of snow, it always makes it a lot uh, more difficult for our students, more dangerous for those um, students who are walking and also for um, you know the people who are driving and then sometimes don't realize that there's students students crossing so i just want to say thank you uh for for working on this for bringing this to us and for um you know really looking into what is best and safe for our students and if you, you are um if you say that um you have already talked to um the, the district administration about this, then I'm pretty sure they already went over the little details like it was mentioned before by one of the commissioners, things like busing and, um, you know, other other um, type of um, little details that need to be taken care of. So I, I trust that um, that you're, you're doing what it's needed to do. And I also trust the um the judgment of the school district on this one and as for um student student patrols um 
you are right. Um, it's we can't put our students in uh, excessive danger, so they also always remain really close and usually are very careful on how far they go and how how much how far they cross as well. So, yeah, no, obviously, you know, I'm in support of everything that it's um, student safety related. So, thank you. Right, I am back. Hopefully you can hear me all. Um, just want to move forward. All right. Thank you, uh, Ms. Marone. So uh, at this point, I just want to uh, maybe make an opportunity here uh, to go and see if there's anybody online that is interested in talking about uh, to the commission about this. So Mr. Markergaard, would there be anybody online that would like to speak to this item? Yeah, Mr. Chair, nobody's pre-registered, so we'll check in with Mr. Pease to see if anybody's called in. Mr. Pease, do we have anybody on the line? There are no callers for this item. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pease. So, uh, planning commission members uh, seem to open the public hearing and nobody is online uh, to uh, speak to this item. I would look for a motion to close the public hearing. Commissioner Goldsman. So moved. All right. Is there a second? Commissioner Corman? Second. Thank you. Commission members, there is a motion to motion and a second to close public hearing. Uh, any further discussion on that? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor of closing public hearing say aye by roll call. Commissioner Goldsman? Aye. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And then I, for myself, motion passes. Public hearing is now closed. Further discussion, commission members, on uh, the motion or the, uh, I guess, uh, the issue in front of us with uh, regarding uh, curb and bump out construction, stripe and change. About it a lot with the question. Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to uh, make this requested motion if there's no further discussion. Not seeing any, go ahead. Uh, we, the Planning Commission, support the staff recommendation uh, of a pedestrian crossing safety improvement at France Avenue and West 180th. 108th Street, which includes curb bulb outs on the north leg of the intersection on both sides of France Avenue and striping changes on France Avenue. Okay, we have a motion, Commissioner Corman. Second. The motion and a second to support the staff recommendations on crossing safety improvements at France at 108th. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Commissioner Solberg. Aye. Commissioner Goldsman. Aye. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Cookton. Aye. And I, for myself, the motion passes. And I believe Chair Solberg is back. I might be. All right. Uh, seeing the motion passes, uh, Commission members, uh, that not seeing any further items for us tonight that concludes the may 13th planning commission meeting if you can hold on for a minute well mr marker guard uh prepares us